Chair, I can confirm you're live on YouTube. Thank you so much. Thank you for attending. Oh, hang on, I might as well do this as I got it. Thank you for attending today's meeting of the Regeneration and Development Panel. The Democratic Services Officer will now conduct a roll call to check who is present at the meeting. When she calls out your name, could you please switch your microphone on and confirm your attendance? Becky. Thank you, Chair. We've had apologies from Councillor Beale, Councillor Bone, Councillor Bauer. Present. <coughs> Councillor Collingham. Present. Councillor Croft. Present. Councillor Gidney. Present. Had apologies from Councillor Jones, Councillor Manning. Present. Councillor Morley. Present. Councillor Rose. Present. Councillor Diwali. Present. Councillor Whitby. Present. Have um, Councillor Moriarty, who is substituting for Councillor Beale. Present. Councillor Sandra Collett, understanding order 34 on Zoom. Present. Councillor Hudson on Zoom, understanding order 34. Present. And Councillor Rise on Zoom, understanding order 34. Uh, present. present, thank you. And then I have portfolio holders, Councillor Blunt. Present. And um, Councillor Sam Sandal on Zoom. No. <laughs> and sorry, I've got Councillor Knockholds and just on order 34 as well. Present. Okay, I think that is everyone, thank you, Chair. We also have the following officers present in the meeting, either in the room or on Zoom. Gemma Curtis, Duncan Hall, Jeff Hall, Hannah Wood Handy, David Usby, Russell Eacott, Michael Uga, Mike Auger. We also represent, uh, welcome representatives from Norfolk County Council to the meeting. Can I remind all that this meeting is being recorded and streamed live via YouTube? By attending this meeting, you are giving your permission to be recorded and streamed. Please keep microphones turned off until you're invited by the chair or vice chair to speak and speak clearly in the microphone. Please ensure that you turn your microphone off once you finish speaking. Apologies from absence we've already had. I can now ask the panel if they agree with the minutes of the previous meeting and I can sign as a true record. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Urgent business, I have none. Members pursuant understanding order 34, we've already had them. Chairman's correspondence, I have none. And I now invite an update on the countrywide local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, commonly known as the LC Whip. David, who is going to present on this item? It's County Councillor Officers on Zoom. Okay. Well, I thought we normally had that. Uh, good afternoon. Yes, yeah, Ed Pineby from Norfolk County Council. I'm just going to share my PowerPoint presentation. Uh, bear with me a second. Can you see the PowerPoint front, the green screen on the screen? Is that working? Sorry, I'm not used to using Zooms. I'm used to using Teams every day. So I'm just trying to find my way to what you can see and what you can't. It looks like you can now see a countywide local cycling and walking infrastructure plan, a green scheme with Kingsland West Norfolk in the top right hand. Sorry. Yes, we can. Yeah. Yep. Brilliant. Can you just see that or can you just see, can you see anything else? We can see a lot of participants down one side of the panel and we can also see the thumbnails of your presentation to the left. Brilliant. OK, I'll go to presentation view and just let me know if anything else is on the screen, because I just, uh, as I say, have a couple of screens open and don't want to be presenting everything. Uh, bear with me a second. OK, brilliant. Uh, thanks for bearing with me. So um, so you're going to be going through the countywide local cycling and walking infrastructure plan. Uh, my name's Ed Parnaby. I'm active travel team lead at the County Council. Uh, this is a key piece of our work and um, I'm going to lead you through today basically um, where we're at. Today, the purpose of today is to go through where we're at at the moment um, and um, cover the engagement that's going to take place on this piece of work. So 
there's a bit of background here. Um, for those who haven't seen it, um, what this will do is um, the LCWIP is a, an acronym given to us by government, which is a very useful one. It's um, Local Cycling and Walking Infrastructure Plan. It is basically an action plan of all the walking and cycling schemes that want to be taken for that we want to be taken forward um, between now and 2030. Um, what that will do, uh, these aren't funded schemes at this stage, although it, it will lead to that, I'll get onto that later, um, but these are um, an engaged list of what the next steps are um, to getting up improvements in the network. So um, there'll be an opportunity to ask questions at the end. Um, I'll give you a little bit of information on, on the LCWIP before I move on to some of the detail. Um, other than an action plan, what it does is it supports the government's ambition of getting 50% of all journeys in our towns and cities to be made by uh, walking and cycling, um, which is quite an ambitious target and certainly one that we are excited to work towards, um, but not unaware of the challenge. Um, so it presents quite a big challenge, I think. Um, it highlights um, what the else it will do is highlight the schemes uh, to key funders. So whilst many people around the room will know the local area very well, um, what the, fund, the funders don't necessarily know this have the same level of detail. So funders could be the Department for Transport, and they typically have been a funder of our capital uh, schemes for walking and cycling. And the LC work will give them a local reference on a document that's been engaged on and shows what the local priorities actually are for walking and cycling and where they are. So it's really important on that level as well. Um, you may not know, uh, but we've already published, uh, we being the County Council, we've already published um, LC whips for Kings Lynn, Greater Norwich and Great Yarmouth. Um, so these are the three you know, largest urban areas uh, and that was the sort of priority set out to us. These cover roughly half the population of Norfolk and the key detail is we're now moving to the county-wide LC whip, which at this stage means the uh, 20, 20 uh, towns and conurbations in the in the county um, and the wider connectivity between them. And uh, we'll get onto some of those uh, in wider detail and some more specific detail today. Um, and just to say as well, I've got a note to remind myself here as well, is that in terms of mentioning not funding, in the King's Lynn and LCWIP, it's already being used to uh, leverage funding from the Towns deal to improve local area for active travel, which is you know helping meet climate change objectives, uh, health and mental health objectives, um, and, and, and and numerous others, you know, which it, it's, it's um, already shown to bear fruit. Um, it's made up of three parts, and these are loosely uh, a network plan, uh, which is your walking and cycling routes, which we'll look at some of the local ones. It's a prioritised programme of improvements, so which schemes should be delivered in the short, medium or long term. Um, and it's a report that then gives you the background. So there'll be a, an LCWIP report in due course uh, published after the engagement has been carried out. And that will give a, a very thorough picture of how we got to that position. Um, and you'll get a bit of a feel for that today, I hope as well. Um, so there are, in essence, uh, six stages laid out by government. And those six, of those six stages, we are um, let that, I'll just leave that side up for a second so get a bit of a feel for what those are um, on the title column in bold. But we're at stage five now, which is quite well progressed. Um, and we are, um, one of the reasons I mentioned here is we're here ahead of the engagement, which will happen in March. And as you see on row, um, row five, uh, we're going to carry out a six week public engagement, which there'll be a bit more detail on towards the end. Um, and this will really help get the priority of the improvements and get a wider uh, public feel for these schemes before they go anywhere near, um, you know, development of further schemes and detailed design. This is that early stage of engagement. So, uh, yeah, I won't go through all the stages, but we're at stage five. Um, welcome to have a copy of the slides if that's useful to get a feel for the journey we've been on. Um, and I mentioned where we've covered. This is probably the right slide for that. We've covered um, the orange circles where you see the larger conurbations. So those are the areas, uh, crudely speaking, just laid out here to see where we've, uh, the extents of, the rough extents of where we've got to. And obviously that left most of Norfolk not covered. Um, and it's it's our desire to cover all of Norfolk, which is what this document is, and try not to leave, uh, try to work out what the priority is, but try to cover everywhere and give everyone, um, every area, a an, an equal um, you know level of, uh, I guess review to find out these and and engagement to find out um, what the right walking and cycle schemes are. Uh, and so there's, there's two the the other ones there are the blue circles, which is basically the areas which this county wide engagement will cover. And looking in a bit more detail, 
Um, so what this means for Kingsland and West Norfolk is um, we've got identified air study areas and primarily these centre on the two urban areas of Hunstanton and Heacham and on Downham Market. And uh, we will drill down into some of the uh, the scheme, the, the network level in a, shortly. Um, this is just a bit of a, um, a gathering of the policy that we've reviewed. So we've reviewed um, a number of different documents are formed into the review for the LC WIP. So it hasn't just been a desktop exercise or on site. We've done um, site audits. Um, and before that, we've done a significant review of all the planning policy or the transport policy, environment and air quality and public health policy. So some of these you'll see in that list worth a quick look through. Um, some of these are very local um, and they're very local specific to understand what's already been talked about in terms of walking and cycling or what's been talked about in terms of uh, housing development, that sort of thing that might be covered in planning. Um, in the transport policy, you'll see a couple, you'll probably see some documents you may not have heard of. These are most of these are national documents. Um, the key one at the top is gear change. Gear change is the government's, um, I'm going to say 2020, I think it was 2020, you know, very much updated from previous documents. Uh, vision, to be fair, is what it is to, uh, it's where that 50% of cycling towns and uh, cities comes from. So those, it laid out the ambitious targets. It's a very interesting document to set out where the wider ambitions for walking and cycling sit. Um, also in there, worth a mention, a standout, I guess, is the Norfolk Local Transport Plan. Uh, that is basically where this the LC whip will sit beneath that as an action plan for walking and cycling. And the local transport plan sits above that with the wider county uh, strategy for um, for transport. So they, they sit alongside each other. There's several others in there. I won't go through them all, um, but I think it's fair to say that there's um, a, a, a number of relevant documents, some of which you'll be familiar with, others certainly worth a look at. Um, and we can we can help with answering some questions on that at the end. Uh, so getting into the network, I said we would look at the network. Uh, this is an indicative network for Hun Stanton and Heacham. So um, what you'll see here are the primary routes uh, laid out in the uh, colours, um, the coloured lines. Um, you'll also see on there uh, areas of the key, key areas that we've, we've regarded as key. And we've tried to lay these out in a way that shows um, shows the connectivity to these priority key areas and they are in essence things like health employment um leisure and educate and tourism um and education if i haven't said it already so you've got education in pink and you can see a strong connection along the routes um the key element there was to try and make the best connectivity between these and some might be rather obvious others less so um and obviously you can see in certain situations you're faced with a lack of route options and others you're faced with many so there's been lots of consideration for those um, Connecting these areas is obviously really key and you can see those, I think you can probably see even on first inspection um, or those who know the area well, that these are um, clearly aligned well with the areas of, uh, of priority. And there's uh, five routes outlined there. Um, I won't go through the five routes because we've got quite a bit in here. Um, so that's the, that's the cycle network. Uh, the proposed cycle network. It's not a set of schemes in detail. It's a set of principles of connectivity and, and important places. Um, this is something we were asked to do in the process of the LC. We were asked to uh, produce a walking zone. A walking zone is, um, as I think was pointed out on the slides, it's not it's not there to create a pedestrian zone, and exclude vehicles. Um, pedestrian zones can be very effective in some streets. That's not not you know that's a, that's I think a, established. What this is is that it's there to say, well, where's the where do people think the areas that's most important where you should have pedestrian priorities. It could be features like wider crossings. It could be pedestrian priority rather than a signal that you press and wait for. Um, it could be wider refuges. It could be a number of facilities that make it easier for um, those walking around the town or those with mobility impairments to get around their town on foot or, or, or wheeling. Um, this is primarily walking and wheeling, really, um, which by wheeling, I'm you know, talking about um, mobility assistance. So that area is up for discussion, especially particularly up for, I guess, um, discussion in the wider engagement, because, you know, should we be going further than that? We think this is the natural uh, extent of that area. Um, there's no specific schemes laid out in that, but it could it could involve any number of the things I've mentioned that make it easier to walk around. Um, so everything we've looked at so far has been on the coast and it's been quite urban. Um, what this slide is, is there to show is a couple of things. It shows that you've got a really good existing trails network um, in the, the routes shown there in the red, um, amber and um, purple on there. Um, the trails network, this highlights that some of these are actually walking only routes and some of these are cycle and walking routes. Um, 
I think they've all got their very strong, useful connectivity. But what they don't do um, particularly is connect into Hunstanton and Heacham. There's a bit of a, a natural uh, disconnect between this uh, accessible uh, green space and activity and leisure and the people. And um, we've been looking at, uh, as part of one of the challenges, was, well, what is the wider connectivity? So we've been asked to look at, well, how do you, what is the wider connectivity with each of these urban areas? So we've considered what that is. And we've looked at, um, these are very much feasibility potential schemes. These are certainly not schemes. What these are is saying, these are potential areas and uh, uh, conurbations and areas you might connect in, the rough alignment of a route, but certainly not a route. And what these look at is how you get those people to the, to the green space and to the trails network. Um, and that might be a number of things that were looked at. The feasibility, when that comes up, we'll eventually need to look at, uh, when we've got funding for it, um, look at what the, perhaps the ways that these could be achieved, perhaps which is the most preferable, it wouldn't necessarily be all of these, um, and which ones deliver that outcome the best. Um, at this stage, as I say, these are probably pretty fair to say they're a very early stage of the principle as much as anything else. Um, and this slide is just showing some additional connectivity. Uh, so similar principles, um, there's a desire to connect uh, Kingsley and Fakenham. Now, obviously, that's clearly very ambitious. Um, there hasn't yet been a review of how that would take place. Um, what we would be considering here is likely connectivity with a series of smaller schemes that make a network of quiet lanes, perhaps where there are lower speed limits, um, and improving crossings, perhaps where it's difficult to get across a main road and uh, address the barriers that exist on some of those routes that are parallel to the main road. Um, in, in that as well is the benefit of, it's not simply connecting Kingsland to Fakenham, it's also the benefit of collecting in the satellite areas, either, you know, near to Kingsland and Fakenham that sit on that alignment. Um, but in essence, connecting rural communities with those urban areas and giving people, and vice versa, people who live in the urban areas, access to green space. Um, so just looking over to the, the other area of focus is down a market. So similarly, um, like I was mentioning earlier, these are the primary routes, like I said. Um, but you can probably see, again, a really good alignment, I believe, here with between um, the pink, which shows education, uh, residential allocations, new developments that are, that are coming forward on the edge of the area. As you can see, they're marked out in the hatching, um, the red and the blue hatching. Um, and of course, they align with everything that's um, there already in terms of many of the areas of green space and, say, employment. So it's, I think it's a really good indicative network. But this is, again, a key area we'll be um, seeking um, feedback in the engagement uh, in March. Uh, and again, a, a walking network. It's a bit abstract until you get, I think this is one where the people in the local area will probably, I think, help it help by informing, well, where should, uh, where is where is most important for walking priorities? And I think here, this is quite a large area showing that um, the potential there for where you can um, improve pedestrian priorities. Um, in terms of wider connectivity, similar picture, um, except here we've got trails networks that go much more to the urban area. So that's the existing trails network uh, in and around down and market. Uh, your key key areas there, your, your regional cycle routes and your Norfolk trails. Um, it's just an opportunity, I think, as well to, to highlight that those networks may not be perfect. Those schemes already might already have themselves have improvements on them that are needed, you know, improved crossings. We're aware of several that will feature in this LC WIP and the wider um, scheme list. Uh, and we want to look at some wider connectivity on this side as well. And you'll see there's quite a bit here. Um, some of the key ones that stand out, I guess, are swap them to down and market. Uh, there's no currently e easy provision to cycle that. And these are some of the longer distance connectivity that connects um, people into the to urban areas. And we will be, con and the engagement will cover those as well. So, in essence, um, we've got a six week engagement period and that six week engagement will is planned to start at the end of March. Um, it'll be in the form of an online survey and it'll have elements that help people look at the area that's most important to them or the areas that are most important to them. Uh, and uh, the County Council will also be holding, um, I think it's approximately seven face to face events, including one at Hunt Stanton. The most, the most locally relevant is Hunt Stanton. Um, and we'll be doing those throughout the engagement to just basically highlight, uh, to get to add a bit of awareness to what we're doing, uh, make sure people are responding, uh, but also to answer questions and just hopefully be a face for um, yeah, the fact that we're having this piece of important active travel engagement to shape the future of these networks. So um, I don't think I've got much else to add. Um, so I think if it's OK, I'll um, we'll go to any questions and uh, myself uh, and Matthew will be on hand to uh, to answer those. Thank you very much, Ed. Uh, I'll now open it up to 
members of the panel to pose any questions they may have. Councillor Crofts. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Uh, very interesting. I would just like to ask the public engagement and what sort of format have you got that planned? Will it be in face-to-face -face or will it be online or what is the plan for the public engagement process? Yeah. Um, so the, the main part of the engagement is a six week online engagement. Um, the face to face is, to, is a auxiliary there to basically make that um, to raise awareness. It's not the key part of the engagement. So the, the face to face part is, is, is only a supporting element. I think it's fair to say um, we need to gather the views collectively in a uniform way. And the survey has been shown to be a very good way of doing that. Um, we got 1600 responses from the previous engagement on LC whips. Um, and we did a lot of additional work to show promotion um, to highlight that. So that included things like um, uh, articles in the, in the news, local newspaper, um, included adverts in social media, uh, that face to face presence we mentioned in the areas as well. Um, and just trying to get as holistic and widespread coverage as we can with the budgets and resource that we've got. Um, and I think that approach will, um, I think, provided we do the things like we are today and we do those other mechanisms we've talked about, I think we will get that coverage that we're looking for. Um, but the wider, the better. Definitely agree. Um, and and uh, I think it's fair to say the team are probably uh, uh, more than willing to hear and we'll, our communications team, any suggestions for where there might be um, you know, opportunity to, to, to um, improve that. Uh, Councillor Diwali. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have quite, quite a few questions, so stop me when you've had enough. Um, first, I think I have to ask about the Norfolk Greenways project because um, there were intentions to use the old, um, the, the routes or somewhere approximating the old railway lines between uh, Kings Lynn and Fakenham and uh, Kings Lynn and Hunstanton. Uh, now, one assumes that feasibility studies were done, um, but they never seem to sort of get to the funding stage so um, I'm, I'm a little bit sort of concerned that we're starting from scratch again um, and have uh, a, a more fragmented um, set of connections between Kings Lynn and, and Hunstanton and what appears to be a, a sort of restart on the Kings Lynn and Fakenham project. Uh, do I start with that one or shall I continue? Can you take one at a time? Thank you. Ed, do you want to respond to that? Yep, yeah, uh, Matthew, would you be happy to... Coming on that one? Yeah, yeah, that's no problem. Can uh, can we have somebody to respond to the question, please? <laughs> so I think Matthew's still there, but something's happened to his connection. I might have rejoined. Um, Sorry, should we? Me, yeah. Oh, yeah. Apologies about that. Um, so the the Greenways project, you know, the the feasibility that's kind of was completed for that is going to be incorporated into the Celsi Whip. So that included multiple options between uh, Kings Lynn and um, Hunstanton. That so there's some sections of that which will hopefully be able to actually start developing through the Jubilee Trails funding. So there is already some schemes we're able to progress. The uh, Kings into Fakenham is a much more complicated one. And as Ed was saying, we're looking to identify ideally multiple schemes that could be delivered. And not, it's not something that could be delivered as a single kind of development because of the size of it. Um, but all that learning is going into this document. Um, but I think just because of the kind of um, detail on that, it's trying to bring this out so it can be presentable on you know this network plan. So it's, it hasn't been lost and it's still something we're looking forward to. Um, we just haven't really had any opportunities for multi-year capital funding yet for um, active travel, but it's something that Active Travel England with the formation of the new body, hopefully will. Um, that's something we're, we're confident we should be coming hopefully this this calendar year so again that's something it's still a kind of priority aspiration for us thank you okay thank you matt uh good to speak to you again um yes uh if i can ask further um we've um the boat the most of the lc whip um for king's lynn um seems to have um um failed to be translated into action, certainly through the um, um, active 
travel component of the uh, Towns Fund. Um, we have two active travel hubs, which um, uh, certainly one cy local cyclist group feels that's not needed and will see little use. Um, and the concerns that if they do fail, um, it will, we will struggle to justify to spending more money on active travel. Um, the LC Whip also included links into Kings Lynn, in particular a link between North Lynn Cycleway and the town centre, and a proper cycleway, a cycleway across the Cut Bridge in South Lynn. Um, they're both desperately needed, um, according to local cycle groups, um, and have been promised for many years, but they've again um, seem to have been dropped on grounds of cost and practicality. So um, I, I suppose there are two questions here. Are these essential links going to be reinstated? And um, if we have concerns about the implementation of the um, Kings Lynn LC whip um, and the previous uh, Greenways project, what confidence have we that we can get um, the Norfolk LC whip um, implemented um, on what is actually a very tight Time scale, if we want to get 50% of uh, journeys by 2030, um, according to the government's ambition. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll make a start on that answer now. I can hit on the funding. I think the funding element is, is that, uh, as Matt's allayed to, multi-year funding certainly makes things uh, more straightforward. We will be getting, we understand that that's something that will be coming. Um, I think in the short term, the LC Whip is, a, is, you're quite right, it is a list of unfunded schemes. Um, as schemes get delivered, they should be taken off LC Whips and there will be a process in place for doing so, um, for, you know, for updating. Um, I think the key thing is that the list prioritises those schemes. So it has an overall view when we've got it in place, we'll have a view of what are the collective um, short, medium term priorities. And I think at the moment, I think in all honesty, because these sit so separately, there isn't really one view on that uh, across. There, is, there isn't one document or one view on that in the county. And this um, will hopefully collect those different views and gather um, the ones that we can put into the priority for that funding. So I think it will hopefully focus that element. I know it's a sort of general answer. Um, I don't know if we, um, Matt, is there anything on there that you wanted to come in on in terms of the um, Kingsland cycle way of thinking? I was just thinking, yes. So I think uh, um, I think with the the LC Whip work, you know, it's we've had the LC Whip in for just over a year, and we've managed to leverage over three million for the town deal, which I I, I think is a positive start. But that's not the entirety of the funding. You know, we're looking forward for future Active Travel England funding. Um, so I don't think the town deal should be viewed as the only. Um, source funding that was you know short-term schemes which were aligned with the wider town deal project and um, so working very closely with our colleagues in west norfolk on that so i think we've got a, a good start but you know we're confident that we'll you know looking forward for more funding to you know keep on the development and delivery of of that um the Kingsland LC Whip, but i'm just conscious this is more about the the wider countrywide LC Whip than the, just the Kingsland LC Whip. Thank you. Understood. It was it was really sort of translating um, experience of one into into the wider um, into the wider scheme. Um, the the only other real major question I have, if I may, please, is regarding um, uh, compliance with um, LTN one hundred and twenty uh, infrastructure design and the gear change policies. Uh, we we seem to have quite a lot of uh, foot weight conversions. And um, I'm informed that, uh, uh, except in very rural areas uh, with low footfalls, these should not be used. Space recycling should be reallocated from motor vehicles. Um, and again, uh, what insurance um, that the schemes will be completed to correct standards? Um, uh, there, there's been concern certainly about the priority crossing at Gaywood Road, which um, uh, according to local cycling groups has been incorrectly installed. Um, it's, it's, it's difficult to activate um, and it doesn't, um, it, it, it doesn't sense people as they approach and it forces a stop even when the road is clear. So again, um, how can we be confident that, uh, that the, um, the advice and policies will be followed and we won't be uh, finding a lot of shared footways rather than finding specific space for cyclists? Thank you.
Uh, I can certainly help to answer that. Uh, we, we of the County Council have um, recently uh, uh, committed to making all schemes LTM 120 compliant. And as you rightfully say, um, shared path is certainly not what LTM 120 is. Uh, let's, I should just clarify this for those who don't know, local transport note 120, which is a, um, uh, a, a if you will, a guidance document, national, very good, uh, published in 2020 that um, shows the standard that we need to be. Um, and you're quite right, it is certainly not shooting for um, uh, for shared paths in the main part. Shared paths, understandably, can be solutions in small sections, connectivity to crossings, um, and perhaps when no other option is, av is available. Um, the County Council definitely in this document and in our forward our plans based on this has committed to make everything LT120 compliant. I think there is going to be some challenges in places, but I think the starting point has to be, as is rightfully said, that's exactly what it should be. Has it been in the past? Not in every case. The, the document only existed in 2020, um, uh, published in 2020, and there's only been a pipe, there's been a pipeline of schemes. We've seen this in Norwich as well um, and across the county where some schemes have come through that have been pre that guidance and what's been delivered is is, is probably uh, below the quality of that guidance. Um, the good thing about that guidance is I think it sets a really good benchmark. Um, certainly the team that Matt and I are in is committed to that and the county council is committed to it. I think we've also got the added benefit of Active Travel England. Um, Active Travel England now sit as a, uh, a government body within the Department for Transport and it one of their key raison d'etre, their, 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 their rationale is to get us to um, you know, local authorities and highways authorities to deliver LCM 120 compliant schemes. Um, they'll work with us where we've got examples where perhaps there's a, a real extent or limit for why that can't happen in short sections. And I think there needs to be compromises still. Um, but I think the starting point has to be what do we do to make this area, LTM, this route LTM 120 compliant? And within um, those network plans that we shared, the assumption is that all of that will be LT LTM 120 compliant um, and was also as rightfully I, you know, I share the view that was uh, expressed there that that can't be shared with footways in the main part you know except it's short you know short instances where absolutely essential that needs to be a separated separated route wherever possible um, and it certainly needs to be separated from car space that's probably a key element and, and cycling from walking um, and I think that's where you mentioned that you know reallocation of road space that is something that I think it has to. We have to be frank. To deliver all the ambitions in an LC whip, you do have to have some reallocation of road space, and I think that's where the sense and care needs to be applied, and also where we need um, political and public support, um, and we need to be able to bring people along for the journey on the wider benefits that aren't just for the person who's walking or cycling or wheeling on that given day, but those holistic benefits that are enormous for the area and the country, um, and we've got to get people along that journey. And I think you know, it's certainly not going to be just you and I that are able to do that. Hopefully that's Act to Travel England and that wider role. We're all a part in that, I think. Um, and uh, yeah, and I think there is a commitment to do that. Um, and to say, if you want specific schemes, um, I'm more than happy to... Um, for the messages to be um, contacted be at the active travel, um, active travel at norfolk.gov.uk, which I can uh, share in the chat or with, or with the chair of the meeting after um, so that we can have... You're frozen. Thank you. Um, hey, you know specific that? questions put to us because um, I don't know anything I've uh, been too brief on. Uh, thank you. You did. For, thank you very much, Councillor Diwali. Have I any other comments from the actual panel members? Councillor Moriarty. Thank you, Chair, and uh, thank you, Mr. Parry. I'm just trying to understand the uh, some of the. The graphics on your presentation, forgive me for not having a page number, but I'm looking at the county-wide LC whip st study area, which has got uh, a yellow um, blob around uh, things then, and then it's got other circles. And then I'm trying to relate that to the very next slide, Kings Lynn with an E, okay. um, which has got a, a slightly different shape and a different geographical coverage. So you've got um, from Swapham to Kings Lynn. And I ask that question because I note that in a later slide you reference, you, you refer to Fakenham to, to Kingsland in terms of whether that could be a, a cyclable route, but I don't see anything in terms of going from Swatham to Kingsland, which is in that, um, in the graphic um, named Kingsland and West Norfolk study area. So I'm question, I suppose my question is why have you talked about Fakenham to, to Kings Lynn and not Swatham to Kings Lynn? But presumably if the target is to 
for 50% of all journeys in cities and towns by 2030 to be um, wheeled or on foot. You've got to be including a large number that are coming out from the rural areas or going out of King's Lynn into the rural areas. I hope that question made sense. Yeah, I, I think I'll, I'll answer some of that on the general points and if possible, we might draw uh, my colleague Andrew in as well. Um, it, in essence, we are, I should have clarified perhaps as well, that um, the gear change document is the vision is 50% of all journeys um, uh, in towns and cities to be cycled, walked or cycled by 2030. But it also covers a slightly more general statement, which is about, um, and it's very much part of the vision, but it isn't as quantitative, I guess, um, is that it wants to make those the normal way, the first choice for travel um, in, uh, you know, in, in rural areas. Um, and that's where some of the rationale for rural connectivity comes from. Some of the rural connectivity comes from access to green spaces like that, like we've talked about, that rural connectivity. But some of it is simply the fact that um, we have an area of employment on the outside of the town or it, we have an area where um, of growth or we want to connect two towns together because they're actually in close proximity and some of the people who live in one work in the other and vice versa so the sort of rationale for that was um, I probably didn't explain that there was a reason why it wasn't just the urban areas it was also those um, interconnectivity because it's uh, it sits wider than those 20. Um, I don't know Andrew are you on the Andrew I'll bring my colleague in just to rep to see if um, on the question of the slides I don't know if I could answer that properly in terms of um, no, thank you, Ed. So uh, if, I think my understanding of the question is, um, why isn't there a, a connectivity between Kings Lynn and Swaffham? Um, I think uh, uh, that's, I mean, as, uh, as part of the work that we've done to identify these key routes, one of the things that we were doing as part of the engagement is asking people to feed back on these particular uh, connectivity proposals. And if there is demand or the need for to provide some provision between Kingsland and Swaffham, then there is scope to include that connectivity. Thank you. You're welcome. Any further questions from panel? In which case, I or do you... Sorry, very quickly. Yeah, Councillor Gibney. I note that uh, there are a lot of um, east-west routes that aren't included in this survey. Um, particularly Hunstanton, Hunstanton to Thorn and Brancaster. There's some back roads which are absolutely superb for cycling and very safe. Um, but also, as a general thing, there's two things, safety and dismounting. Safety, um, you've covered pretty well, I think, but where can, when you arrive somewhere, where do you put your bike? How can you be sure that it'll be there when you come back or not vandalised, that sort of thing? Is there a scheme registering bikes, putting trackers on or whatever, registering journeys or anything like that. It's just that, you know, you hear so often that people take a bike out and they put it somewhere and when they come back, the wheel's gone or something like that. Have you addressed those points? You, you don't don't need to um, respond because of time, but if you just promise that you look into it. Thank you. Yeah, I can definitely promise we'll look into it and I can promise that it's already included. It's general um, in so far as we haven't said eight, new cycle sp uh, spaces here but I think the key things are that there's an adequate amount of cycle parking in the right spaces and to address not just the right spaces generally speaking if they're near the front doors and they're useful and accessible to the network they're also quite secure um, there's also a separate element to that which is secure cycle parking um, we need multi-year funding to do secure cycle parking and we anticipate including that in future bids where we get multi-year funding um, and that could potentially be um, in these urban areas that are in the LC WIP um, so I think that's key um, and we'll, we'll address cycle parking, it's as I say, but we haven't got individual dots where it should be at this stage. It's more a case of, um, but it is referenced in the LC with engagement and it will be, there are questions based on it and it's a very important um, part of this puzzle. Thank you. Uh, okay. Can I call on um, uh, standing order 34? Uh, I'll ask Councillor Rives to comment and Councillor Knockholes, I do see you. Uh, thank you very much, Chair. Um, I represent a, a rural area, and it does concern me that as part of the policy or part of the strategy is to kind of uh, create an infrastructure for cycling. It presumably follows that another part of the strategy must be to discourage car use. Uh, and I would be concerned that people who live in rural areas such as mine, uh, many of whom are elderly, uh, aren't going to be in some way sort of uh, punished by the fact they are going to have a requirement to use their cars. Um, so my concern is that for the strategy to work, presumably you've got to kind of penalise or discourage car use, but how on earth are you going to protect the interests of those people who really do have no choice but to use their cars? Thank you. 
Do I have somebody who's prepared to? Yeah, sorry, I was just clicking on the, it, it double clicked and put me back on and off. Um, thank you for the question, it's a very good one. Um, I think this is one of the key challenges and one of the main reasons that we do engagement is because we're going to have um, different views. And I think we've got to work out where, which priorities exist where. Um, I think there are some general statements that can help address what we, what's what been raised there, which is that, um, I'll give the example of congestion. Um, it's fair to say many of the journeys taken by car are essential, and it's fair to say that many aren't. Um, I think what we have, where we have peak congestion and people not able to access sites, um, one of the reasons is, is that they're the people who are in the car who may have had, a, if, if provided with a different option, would have taken it. Um, could have actually made, enabled the network to run more smoothly. So by giving people options, we're relieving congestion. Um, and that's that has to be seen as a real part. If you're, if you're shifting people from solo private cars, so in Norwich we have 85% of the cars at peak time are solo occupants um, into a, a more compact space, you are going to have a more uh, free-moving network. Um, and provided you do it right, there's obviously devil in the detail. Um, and it's important that those schemes are uh, aware of that. So I give an example where you want priority routes, you need um, to make sure that you're not discouraging car drivers on the routes that you want them to be moving on free flowing. But perhaps in urban areas where you've got those walking zones, you're using more widespread uses of things like 20 mile an hour zones, uh, appropriate speed calming, because it's not always, um, it's not always the right solution. Um, better priority crossings that people know to slow and are more aware of what's around them, and a safer, better place. So th those those shouldn't preclude access by car but i think it's fair to say when you look at those figures that we're placed with, with the, the guidance from government there obviously is a inevitably in that number that is based around there being a shift um, and a, a modal shift from um, cars to uh, to walk in cycling and, and perhaps some some other sustainable means um like passenger transport but we've got to make sure that we've got a network that caters for the people who do need to drive as well and that's that could be a, a number of factors and that's about getting those ones that i mentioned right which is um alleviating the network by reducing some of the congestion for people who don't need to travel i think that's really important and if the network's right it will do that um and making sure the most vulnerable people who are like uh, trying to get access to the front of a building and need to whether that's essential loading or those with disabilities which are going to need the access to the buildings um, and that you know and to services um, so it has to be sensitive to that um, and I think we've, we've done a significant amount of stakeholder outreach uh, and the other key place that that will happen with, with groups that are you know represented in what I've just uh, outlined there but I think it's also key that the wider public gets to hold their view you know and all the views in between uh, will get to feedback on that and um, yeah we will have a I think we will have an idea of which schemes are uh, more favoured where um, and some good new suggestions that will come out as well, I imagine, um, and some contention around some of the others where people I know might not want it and they might have a suggestion of where it should, what route it should take. And we have to then take that in and um, work out what the right uh, course of action is to recommend. But any scheme that's in this LC WIP, any future will be consulted on with a full as a normal full public consultation it's not a it's a it's an, an additional step it's not a it's not a removal of an engagement step so um you know it's a way of bringing it all together and having uh schemes that have already had uh, a level of uh, public uh, engagement on to have a feel for whether we're pushing the right scheme or whether we should take us and or it's the high enough priority to be uh in, in the view of the people who live there and use it um so i hope that answers the question but i don't think it's a simple answer by any means thank you Ed. uh Councillor Knockholds. Uh, thank you. For, thank you very much. I very much welcome the extension of the actual active travel route through West Norfolk. Because as a borough, we're always promoting um, walking and cycling on our Visit West Norfolk site. So it's good for residents and, and, and of course, visitors. And I noticed on your map, there's two items I was interested in is the Jubilee Trail and the Norfolk Coastal Path extension. And I just wondered how, A, how, um, whether the Coastal Path extension has started or when will it be starting? And, and also, um, last, la late last year, we had a site meeting at Edward Benefer Way um, in Kings Lynn because many cyclists and pedestrians use a very narrow footpath. And I'm just wondering whether that is a part of the Jubilee Trail, which um, I've noticed on your map. Okay, um, I'm happy to um, cover those. So um, just to start with on the status of the Jubilee Trail and the Coast Path extension, the, um, the Jubilee Trail will be hopefully launched this spring. And this is part of five new um, Norfolk trails, which have been put in to kind of 
celebrate the best kind of landscapes we've got across Norfolk. So that's a, a new walking route between um, Heacham and Sandringham. Um, so we saw it was quite an, an apt one. It was um, the the original idea came through the the Queen's Platinum Jubilee Committee last year, and they thought it was such a good idea. They wanted to continue it to kind of comm comm commemorate um, the Queen. So that's something that it was paused, and then they decided that they're, they're happy to kind of continue it. So that should be launched in the spring. Um, if you, I'll. I'll I'll send to the chair the, the website from the Platinum Jubilee Committee, um, but they've got some information, but we'll have more kind of information on that and a launch event in the spring. So that's the first one, the Coast Path extension. Um, so that will continue the Coast Path from Hunstanton all the way to Sutton Bridge. That will um, hopefully... Um, if uh, We're just waiting for final confirmation from Natural England, but they have... Um, put forward the actual plan on, on the routing. So once we get this sent from Secretary of State, that will be uh, implemented. We're hoping that's gonna be next financial year. And um, so the team's all ready to put that in, but I think it'll be a fantastic visitor opportunity that we have, the, you know, two new trails, you know, between Kingsland and Hunstanton. Um, I think it's gonna be a real destination for sustainable travel. So um, something we're really looking forward to putting in. Um, with regards to the Edward um, Benford Way, um, that scheme is something I'm reviewing with our wider highways colleagues. Um, the, um, the parcel of land isn't within the highway, so it's taking a bit longer just to find out a bit more detail on the, um, the owner because it's currently in the local plan. So there is potential to see if we can get that updated. Um, but I'll, I'll get back to you um, and Councillor Sandal on that, um, just waiting on some final details on that because um, I do know a proposal was put in for that parcel of development so just trying to get more detail on on that scheme okay thank you very much thank you do I, colleagues do i have any further comments fine then um i just note that the update is noted thank you very much very interesting and um, we now move yeah. on to the west winch framework master plan and i would invite jeff hall to present this item thank you Thank you, Chair. Um, this is going to be a little bit of a double act. So I've got Hannah here, and I think to a certain extent, Duncan might be able to chip in as, as, as well. Um, you've got before you a, a report to Council uh, recommending that the West Winch Framework Master Plan be adopted as supplementary planning guidance to, to guide the development of this uh, key strategic growth area within the borough. Uh, attached to the report is a copy of the Master Plan itself along with um, responses that have been received in uh, respect of a public consultation exercise, which took place over, I think, a seven and a half week period. And the recommendations um, that, that well, the recommended changes that we're going to make as a result of that consultation process. Um, I think rather than go through in, in great detail um, at, the, at, at this stage, um, I'd, I'd be happy to open to any questions that the panel may have. Thank you very much. It's very, um, <clears throat> very meaty item um, and I'm sure that it will come back to us again. Um, so on the basis of what we have presented to us here, can I invite questions firstly from the panel? Thank you. Councillor Gibbon. Being the borough councillor for the West Winch Ward, I get to hear a lot of uh, comments and opinions about this project, which has been ongoing since 2016. So it's been seven years, during which the external, what would you call it, environment in which this project is to go ahead and prosper has completely changed. And it's one thing that greatly concerns them because at the time in 2016, we were looking at um, regional uh, advantages for Kings Lynn expanding into West Winch, which uh, no, longer, no longer apply. And there are problems which you have to surmount in a project like this, which I'm come, again coming from the community that I represent. And firstly, it is a length of time that this project is going to go on, the form in which the, the shape, if you like, of the development and the, the control of the development 
And then the uptake of the development, who's going to live there, the type of housing. So far, we have, if you like, uh, the future, we hope to reach a position of sort of carbon neutral by 2050. And we, we've got about another 27 years to get to that point. So really the project should be aimed at that and that should be one of the principal concerns in my view and their view or, or the principal ob objects of, the, of this um, uh, development. In, in a way, if you look at something which was much larger like Milton Keynes, they looked at it a bit in a different way. They had a, a scheme which had certain design parameters which address future transport and living. But so far, this project has looked at, if you like, the, the planning um, approach to it rather than the development approach. Um, so having so many landowners, stakeholders, if you will, and things to overcome in this project, it's quite a difficult one. And reading the um, Will, William Sales Partnerships, WSP's report, on reviewing, having regard to the timescales assumed, information available at the time and sensitivity testing around the assumptions applied, the viability assessment concludes that the overall proposed development is potentially capable of being viable while delivering the infrastructure and section 106 costs identified. This has been demonstrated through stress, stress testing and the base viability assumptions through sensitivity analysis and also various scenario tests. Could somebody explain to me what exactly that means? Because I don't see any tests or figures. And I don't see any projections of sort of best outcome, worst outcome, and so on. Forgive me, I don't want to spoil anything, but this is just how members of the community I represent feel. And can anybody answer that, please? Thank you. Thank you, Chair. I'll try, Chair. The, uh, the question that Councillor Gidney has raised effectively goes back to um, base principles uh, in terms of you know should this site have been allocated or not that's that's not the purpose of, of this document um, the council have has allocated this plan in the in the this area in the current local plan it, it is for up to four thousand houses it, it it is the it is the most important allocation that we've got it is effectively the um the the hub around which um the the the, the strategy and the, and the plan revolves. Um, what the master plan is trying to do is is to make sure that we can bring forward that, that strategy in a in a meaningful and coherent way. Um, I appreciate that some people um, don't support the allocation. They didn't support it in in twenty sixteen, and probably don't now. But certainly, um, I think the the consultation responses that were received uh, over that seven and a half week period. Um, we're, we're generally positive people trying to to make this this development come forward and and to work um and, and that's the purpose of, of of this this master plan um any project of of, of this scale has um the potential for problems to uh, to arise what we're trying to do is to um in, in collaboration with 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 the county homes england uh, highways agency we, we, we're trying to overcome those problems and, and the master plan we see as a, as a key way of setting out the vision for this area and, and and to resolving those issues may i ask so if you run into problems or whatever um uh, do you have a plan to sort of develop or look at them i'm, I'm particularly worried about drainage at the moment <clears throat> there have been um some suggestions for uh the way drainage can be achieved. Um, normally, if we, if normally if we put in, say, on a smaller scale, an application in, we will we'll, we will have um, at least have looked at it. Um, I just wonder if you could uh, tell me a bit more about that, please. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean the 
The drainage strategy as a whole for the allocation is being looked at um, by the Lego Flood Authority as a statutory consultee um, for drainage in flood zone one uh, areas. Um, they, in responding to individual plan applications um, on the allocation, of which there are two, the Hopkins homes at the top of the site and the, the Metacre um, uh, site in, in, in the middle around the rectory lane area, are looking at how the drainage, individual drainage strategies for those sites fit into the whole and have looked at flow plans and, or, and flow plans, um, et cetera, across the overall site and how those drainage strategies fit in. Uh, they've also looked at uh, and assessed the, um, the East of Ouse IDB's um, drainage strategy for the West Winch area as well, knowing that there are um, issues with surface water drainage in that locality. Uh, and, and any responses to uh, drainage will be dealt with via individual planning applications, um, of which the IDB and the Lead Local Flood Authority, in fact, several IDBs and the Lead Local Flood Authority are working on various different drainage strategies at the whole, but the, at the moment. But the key issue here is the LLFA look at the whole scheme and how those individual elements fit in and how there can be betterment for off-site drainage issues, such as where uh, your constituents are referring to in terms of access, you know, flow paths through to the, the puny drain, et cetera. Um, what the development seeks to do is ensure that it washes its own face on site, but also that it doesn't make um, a situation any worse. And if it has opportunities for betterment off site, then, then that is what the Elite Local Flood, Flood Authority will seek to achieve. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. But it, with regards to the time scale, you've got no way of predicting how that will run, have you? Um, how long it will take to develop. So is the project, is it intended that it be flexible? How can you do that with so many stakeholders? Well, that's, that's, that's the point um, in terms of, obviously we've got several different landowners, as you know, it's about 21 landowners on board. You've got two major landowners as well, as well as a group of collaborants, um, which the Borough Council have been working uh, closely with to secure an agreement within those areas in order to bring infrastructure forward. I mean, as, as developments go, and there, there are people far wiser than me here with regard to a development appraisal and economics, but you know, develops have, developments have peaks and troughs. And you're constantly looking at viability across the life of a development to ensure that it that it is viable as it goes along. Um, obviously, we can't preclude against crashes. You know, there are ups and downs in the economy, um, but we will respond accordingly. And we've recently been looking at again viability appraisal and updating viability work on um, the infrastructure delivery plan as, as well that I know Nikki's been working on. So we do respond accordingly to those issues. Thank you. There is one other issue which will come up again, and uh, I know it has come up already, and that is uh, with regards to cycle connection to Kings Lynn. That's going to be very difficult because of the Hardwick roundabout. Is there any room or possibility of having an underpass at any point under the A47 to, to actually join that part and also for, you know, keen pedestrians? Thank you. Okay, um, active, tra active travel um, is, is particularly coming to the fore, and obviously you, you just had a presentation for the County Council on those kind of issues as well, as well as the, the LC WIP. As part of the LC WIP um, proposal, we are looking at how um, the overall Kings Lynn cycle routes can link into West Winch. If there are opportunities to develop those links, then we will do that. Um, as part of the, the master plan itself, you'll notice that there's a section on active travel and, and sustainable transport, bus links, et cetera, et cetera, throughout the site to make the site more accessible for those people who want to use public transport or cycle or, you know, or, or walk um, to work. And that is coming to the fore. You have to have an eye to the fact that we're also in a rural area. And there will always be those people who need to obviously travel by car. But any opportunity we, we can get um, for active travel, pedestrian cyclists, then we will take that. Um, going forward, obviously, uh, I don't think active travel England has been finalised yet. Correct me if I'm wrong, Duncan. I don't think they're quite a statutory consultee yet. But going forward in terms of future applications coming forward, um, that the government set up another Quango Active Travel England, will be, which will be a statutory consultee on major developments going forward, ensuring those pedestrian cyclist links through. Thank you. Just. Yeah. Oh, sorry, we do have somebody else, Peter, you are rather... Okay, should I just finish up? Yeah, yeah. okay. So the only other thing which was in connection again with that, and that is um, 
and it's not really specifically for um, the West Winch development, but it is West Winch um, has a very poor bus service. And of course, there's no connection to, not, not a realistic connection to rail. I mean, there is a choice between Watlington or Kings Lynn. Uh, Kings Lynn is more difficult to get to. If there's an underpass for the cycleway, which goes through Hardwick and perhaps that way, um, Hardwick, you know, industrial estate, then there's potential to, to take a, a, a cycle to, to the Kings Lynn station. So perhaps that's something that could be added. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and again, it's just it's it not not just with the housing element. Obviously, the housing under the road go hand in hand. There's a lot of work being done um, on the the MRN funding application with regard to active travel. Again, and that is that is one of the, the you know the links that we're looking at. Whether there's opportunities to take um, a cycleway down the Puny Drain along that way, links which will directly kind of link both the Watlington end uh, and the Kingsland end in terms of of rail travel. So all those options are being looked at. Um, you know, by both um, sides, both the housing side and, and, and the road side in terms of the County Council. Thank you. Thank you both. Yeah, yeah just a quick point going back to your question, um, the, your first question, Peter, um, when you read out the statement from, from around viability, just, it's just worth pointing out that um, going back to something Jeff said and underscoring it, th this is about the master plan. There will be other reports that cover the sorts of things that you you were thinking about around a collaboration agreement about how um, over over the period of 18, 19 years, um, uh, how it will work in practice. I think, um, you know, that point about viability, we, we have tested viability, we continue to test viability and sensitivity analysis, and it changes, it's going to change over time, it's going to change with building reg regulation requirements, it's going to ch change with house price cycles. Um, so we'll we'll do that. But with strategic sites like this, um, most of them aren't very viable. It's a it's it's a it's a balancing act. There's an enormous ask on infrastructure um, from schools to obviously a contribution to a new road costing millions, and millions of pounds. So it's it's but but that those tests will be applied throughout the period and then decisions about what comes next and and phasing and timing and all those sorts of things come into play. Thank you. Thank you. But just be, I'm, I just have to say that um, when presented with a report like this, it's my duty to ask these questions. Thank you. Drives, I think. Sorry, I missed that. My Did we, we give me an opportunity to speak here? Please speak. Oh, sorry, I, there was a problem with this one. Yeah, it's just an issue which I think has been referred to obliquely by both Hannah and by Councillor Gidney. Um, I haven't seen any discussion or any work on the strategic sort of merits or otherwise of having a railway station as part of this development. Uh, and I wouldn't want to go over the pros and cons for it now, but I would like to think that someone somewhere within perhaps County Council is taking a very serious look at the, at the advantages of a new railway station south of Kings Lynn and what that would do for this area uh, and what that would do for the strategic viability of this entire development. But I have sort of on and off sort of mentioned this and raised it with various people. I've had no response whatsoever. So do I conclude that actually this is something which has been considered and isn't, isn't viable? Or do I conclude this is something which has not been considered and has not been thought about at any level? In which case I'd be rather worried because I think, you know, that. <laughs> It's with, with this large population, which we hope to have here, and the issues of accessibility to the south, to Cambridge and to Darwin, uh, and indeed from uh, people in this area, in, in southwest Norfolk, to the QEH, a railway station in this location has a lot of merit. And I'd like to think it is being considered. I wonder if you can sort of advise me on that, please. Right. Thank you, Councillor Ives. Do I have anybody who's prepared to answer that one? Yeah. Do, I, do I see a hand? Well, I'm slightly confused, uh, Chair, because there is no railway going through the site. So you could have a railway station, but it, it does rather need a railway to connect to. Um, and, and you certainly couldn't, you couldn't divert the railway to run into that site because that would be, it, it would just make the, the, the scheme ludicrously e e expensive. The, I mean, come, come, there is a railway line going south from King's Inn and the, the, uh, a station there could be designed not, not so that it's the site. It's a cycle ride from the site. 
I, I think this is slightly out of the scope of this particular report um, by somewhat country miles. So I think we're going to just park the railway for the moment, if I may mix my metaphors. Thank you. Mr Moriarty. Thank you, Chair. It was remiss of me at the outset of the meeting to not um, declare an interest as the County Councillor for this area. And since I find myself unable to do anything other than see this item through the prism of being a County Councillor, I will not contribute to the debate or take any part in the vote. Thank you. Thank you. That's very gracious of you, Councillor Moriarty. Do I have any more comments? Councillor DeWalt. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, most of my questions have been asked already. You'll be pleased to hear. But um, I, I mean, one thing that I have noticed um, sitting in on various discussions is that um, there are concerns that um, the, the uh, St Mary's Church is going to be swamped uh, by development. Um, and you've mentioned that you, you've given the impression that this is a living document with a certain amount of flexibility in it. So if can you just confirm that is indeed the case? And if you know what sort of level of revision will this be reconsulted upon if, if necessary. Thank you. Um, I think in terms of the document itself, what the document does is set out the parameters for development. Um, it provides flexibility so that if, if a development needs to respond because of there are constraints, then, then, then it allows that flexibility to respond. Um, I don't think we would have um, any further reconsultation uh, on the document, you know, once it's it, obviously it's recommended to council, or recommended to cabinet and, and then to council. It may down the line be revised for a particular issue, but as far as we have seen it at the moment, there is sufficient flexibility within this document to allow for changes at an application stage. Um, you know, there has been a heritage impact assessment um, done as, as, as part of the local plan. That obviously makes that a, a, an assessment of any impact around the historic areas at the pinch point, if you like, of West Winch. Um, and, and that recommends that, that any proposals and mitigation is, is considered at, at the application stage. Uh, and, and again, you know, it's, it's set within the, the SPD that, you know, heritage will be taken um, account of and responded to um, accordingly. Any balances, um, you know, in terms of um, all the different issues uh, associated with the planning application will need to be balanced out at that planning application decision stage. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Do I have any further comments? In which case, the panel are requested to consider the report and make any appropriate recommendations to council. And the cabinet recommendation that the cabinet notes the contents of this report and recommends to council that the West Winch Growth Area Framework Master Plan, SPB, Appendix 3, be adopted and used as a material consideration in the determination of planning applications. So we are asked to note that. Thank you very much. Um, we now move on to item nine, which is the Guildhall project overview of the budget. Who is to present this item? Okay. Thank you, Hannah. Mike? Mike Olga. Okay. Uh, can I call on Mr. Olga to present this item, please? Is um, Cool, thank you. Sorry, can you hear me? Yep. Excellent. Uh, um, okay, I'll just uh, try and quickly share my screen uh, um, and hopefully you can see the presentation. Um, yep. Just, no, okay, oh, sorry about that. Uh, um, I'll try that again. Has that come through? Just, uh, um, sorry, is that coming back and failed, failed again? Apologies for this. I will. Well, we have got it. Thank you, Mike. We can see that now. Okay, excellent. Um, okay, so this uh, update is obviously in after we came to you at the last R&D panel with our update following um, the HLF application and uh, um, our summary of our next steps and what we're going to do. And I think um, obviously at that meeting there, it was requested that we came back with an uh, overview of the budget. 
update and actually uh, um, from where we were from the rebirth stage one and actually where that's at with the project. So hopefully this just gives you a brief summary of uh, where we are with that. Uh, um, so obviously in terms of the project summary, obviously we know the overall project cost is um, yeah, 12.1 million of which we have the 8 million TANS fund, uh, um, 750,000, which have been relocated from our um, capital budget. And then the 3.3 million, which um, had been identified for the Heritage Fund bid, uh, um, but was agreed in the April cabinet to underwrite further to, uh, subject to a further decision being taken on the final project scope and the extent of funding required. Um, the split of that is uh, said with 12.6 capital with uh, 1.6 million. And I think as we discussed last time, the heritage lottery application aims to secure the revenue uh, element of this work. And I think what we covered in the update was we were looking to come back with two reports. Uh, one in the spring, which was giving you an update on actually where the project sat uh, um, following the funding announcement from the Heritage Fund and actually how we were going to be looking to take forward the project with the funding which we had, other funding opportunities, and actually that review of the activity plan, which was going to focus on some of that uh, rev revenue funding. Um, but in the meantime, progress with uh, the design work through the Reaper Stage 2 and Reaper Stage 3 works, uh, um, which would allow us to hopefully get in the autumn or to the back end of next year in a position where we would have more certainty over the capital works cost and would allow us to make that decision um, around actually what the final scope of the works would be uh, um, and actually how we could actually meet the town's fund outputs and uh, uh, what we need to meet in terms of uh, um, the lease agreement with the uh, National Trust. Um, so in terms of the main headings uh, around the budget summary, I think uh, um, what we had from the Reaper Stage 1 cost plan was a building waste estimate of 5.6 million, uh, um, yeah, which included uh, uh, yeah, some money in there for the exhibition of fit, fit out. Uh, um, I think the main other one on there is the 3.4 million there, which we've got the professional fees overheads. I think uh, um, that includes the design uh, team element. And I think uh, um, obviously we are, as we I think a number of us would have seen, we're due to go out on the, or go um, and start undertaking the invitation to tender for the lead design team shortly. Uh, um, and so, we haven't gone into further detail on that because the costings for the design team will form part of our uh, scoring exercise when we go through the tender exercise. And then the final uh, uh, slide, which I was going to show here, is just a very brief high level summary of actually what the costings were from the Rupert Stage 1 cost plan. And I think this just give an indication of actually how the costs have been split across the site uh, um, and what they were looking at. And I think just how at that point in time, once we completed the stage one report, how those costs have been split across the size. I think obviously this is what we'll be developing as we go through the Reaper stage two and three, uh, um, and actually we'll be undertake the further surveys, uh, um, and actually, yeah, the develop for the further costs. So hopefully that provides us a helpful indication of actually where we're the project. Uh, um, yeah, happy to take any questions. Thank you. Um, I know Councillor Diwali, did um, free ask through email some incisive questions uh, around these numbers. So I wonder, um, Mike, whether you've seen Councillor Diwali's email. Um, yes. Yeah, and whether you have specific answers to his queries. Um, yes, I can go through some of the responses now, if, if that's helpful. Uh, um, would you like me to go through Councillor Wally's questions? Are you happy for me to read them out, Councillor Wally? Did, is, is uh, yes. that the right way? Thank you, Chair. Well, they're, they're quite, quite extensive questions, so if, you, if you're if you happy to pre-see them, yeah. I'm, I'm happy for you to do that. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. Mike. I think okay. that um, Yes, I try. I think, say, I think one of the first points on there was actually just in timing of the, the um the update and actually in terms of how it's met with the, the underwriting question, and actually, effectively, when will the council be able to decide, decide its position and, you know, clarify some of the uncertainty actually where with the funding? Um, I don't think this is where, I think what this is what we tried to set out in the previous update 
to uh, to the panel. And I think this is where we've talked about this update coming in the spring, which was just kind of saying, having done the HLF funding, actually do that review of where we are with the activity plan and actually with some of the other funding opportunities, which hopefully will come off, how can we actually carry out that revenue element of the work and actually what impact would that have on the wider business plan? Um, and hopefully that was talking about coming in back in the spring. Um, but then in, alongside that, we're hoping to do um, the Ruby Stage 2 and Ruby Stage 3 works, which will allow us to come back uh, following the completion of Ruby Stage 3, 3 and do that review of the, uh, the capital works for the site. And actually, yeah, where we are, where are we with the, the funding? And actually, if do we need to do some prioritisation or phasing needed to ensure we're meeting the town's fund and the business case outputs? Okay, thank you. If you wish to continue, is there uh, question two? Um, I think, again, it's uh, the second question was around actually those headings of the cost things yeah. on the, um, uh, so, so, um, the second page, third page, sorry. Uh, um, I think, yes, there, there is further detail behind the, those cost things. Uh, um, and I think, yeah, I think, again, it's just a question of timings, actually, when we can go through it in the right for form to go through. I think the, the the headings which were provided by the the QS on that were um, standard headings under each item covering demolition structure walls floors and roof doors and windows and then provided the subtotal and I think again that was they were developed on the basis of you know making the roof stage one report how that was in response to the business plan and you know the repair schedule for the site which had been prepared by the Morton partnership. Um, so I think, you know, it, yeah, I, I think that detail is there. And I think it's whether it's, yeah, I think we've only got a short update here, but it's like that can be provided, uh, um, whether it's outside this meeting. Uh, um, yeah, I was going to say, I was uh, sort of dug I good, put his hand up. Yeah. I was just going to say, I think there are some elements of Mike's response to you, Councillor Diwali, that we shouldn't, shouldn't be covering in an open session. So I think there's a reply on its way, but we can't go through all that detail, if that makes sense. Is that acceptable, Councillor? That is acceptable, yes, okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Right, um, what else have we got? Um, yeah, no, no, no. Uh, I'm, I'm talking about Councillor de Wally's comments. No. Uh, is, is there anything, given, <laughs> given that situation, is there anything more that you are willing and able to add publicly then? Thank you. Um, regarding the remaining questions. Um, and I, I think one of the most important questions is the last one, which is yeah. the priorities for scope reduction. Um, yeah, and I think this is that we have been through and identified some high level phasing scenarios. And I think, you know, and I think these been identified to prioritize the areas of the site, which will, yeah, help us secure the town's fund outputs and also meet the lease, lease obligations for the repairs and maintenance uh, um, for the National Trust. Um, and these facing options are what we're hoping to explore with the appointed lead design team. And I think, uh, um, yeah, and again, this is what we'll be looking to, yeah, come back to consideration after we've done that Ruby Stage 3 works to ensure that, you know, we have got the funding to, to allow us to do the works which we need to do. So I think we're at that stage where we, have got some high level uh, phasing we're doing, but I think it's something which we were looking to explore more fully as we go through these next Rupert design stages. Thank you, because uh, for me, the other key issue was there's some surprising budget allocations. There are things that I would have expected to be much higher and others that perhaps are much lower, but in, in, in the most part, the, the, um, I, I would have assumed that more money would have been required for, uh, for, for, um, for the, the individual aspects um, of the project, uh, not least the Guildhall itself. Um, yeah, I've I just seen Russell's put his hand up. Uh, um, uh. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I'm just wondering whether, just to make this a bit easier, you've had experts identify as part of the stage one report what they believe to be the costs for the redevelopment to meet the business case aims um, and objectives. Um, I think by moving on to the next stage, by appointing the design team, we begin to firm up on some of those figures, we get more clarity. There's some quite a bit of survey work to be undertaken, which will 
validate some of those costs or maybe even identify one or two more. And the big ones are often around things like asbestos and, uh, and services of which there'd be, there'd be many. So I think, you know, I, I would say that as we go through the next design stages, which is minimal cost in view of the scope of the 12 million pounds we're talking about, you will get much more cost confidence, much more idea about what actually needs to be done to deliver the outputs. And there will be some decisions that will need to be made, as Mike quite rightly said, is how do you actually reduce the scheme down if we end up with only nine million pounds to spend rather than the 12 million pounds? How can you phase it? But we've got to go through that next stage with those other appointed experts to be able to analyze all of that fully. And um, one of the reasons I'm here is to bring in some new project reporting processes. And hopefully in the future, you will see some of that discussion take place within those project highlight reports and the uh, announcement that we were going out to a, um, an ITT, I think, which came as a bit of surprise for one or two people. Um, and that uh, you'll gradually see that and we will be undertaking reviews at each design stage to make sure that we are content with the budget, the scope of work in moving forward. And I would imagine that a lot of that will be reported back to members in various forums like this, as well as a major project board. Okay, thank you uh, for your responses. Um, I, I will look forward to the, the, the written responses to my question, which uh, or questions, which I, I'm most grateful for the offer. And uh, if they could be shared with the panel, I would also be grateful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Councillor Dewali, for your very detailed, very interesting email. I think this is an iterative process, which we're all going to follow with extreme interest. And I think it needs to be discussed in a collegiate fashion so people's real concerns can be addressed and uh, responses given in, in that light, if you see what I mean. Yeah. Councillor Rives, oh, unless I have any other panel members. Oh, sorry, Councillor Rives, I have Councillor Morley in the distance. Uh, oh. <laughs> From a distance? I'm not going to sing it. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, I have to say, the whole thing, uh, this project is still swirling with fog, actually. I didn't understand much of that last debate at all. So if we just go back a little bit, certainly the ITT, that's an invitation to tender, came out as a real surprise. I think it was very disrespectful. It was in the news and not to publish to members. I've already made this point. MVP. What uh, the project initiation document we haven't seen, I don't know if it's been completed, but in the October... Uh, sorry, in the November, December, I can't remember the exact date now, Officer Major Projects Board, the fact that a comms plan, a communications plan was needed, was identified, and one hasn't materialised yet. And it seemed to me that the first thing that we want to clear the fog in uh, R&D or CPP is what is the plan that's going forward now? Uh, who, when is the tender going out? Who is the adjudicators? What are the adjudication criteria? How uh, the lead design expertise, you know, how are we identifying that? Have we got expertise to identify the expertise? Uh, I, I, when we look at the plan, it might be that the break point at phase three comes in with another administration. So that administration needs to be, that will, a briefing will have to be made in middle of May for that administration to get on board. Who knows, who knows the constituents of that? So I would like to see a communications plan I would like to know what the uh, when the, in the ITT date uh, timings. I'd like to know the criteria. I'd like to know the adjudication team and their qualifications to do this, uh, so that we get off on a on a, a sound footing. Because without the without the expertise in the local design team, we're not going to get off onto a sound footing. So it's, it, this this is this you know, we can't have feet of clay on twelve million quid. So we need strong feet. We need a strong foundation. In terms of the plan, as well as uh, as well as the construction, so I will be looking, uh, Chair, that a, a communications plan can, clarifying all of this data comes forward as quickly as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Does anybody have a, a, a can respond to Councillor Morley on this particular issue? No, that's rather worrying. Um, thank you. Um, I have met Councillor Morley and we have had a, a long discussion um, and part of that is about the project improvements that I said that one of the reasons that uh, I'm currently working in, in Kings Lynn. 
Um, in the future, there will be project highlight reports every month that will be available to members on MudGov and will be discussed every other month at a major projects board. And that would have picked up, and I apologise that the ITT wasn't announced in advance to members, but that will clearly be on there. And so would be the next steps. So if you like a much more detailed uh, comms plan, information about the project initiation document and the ITT will be on those project highlight reports that will be published so all members can see it on a monthly basis. Thank you. Uh, that's all very well, Russell, but it hasn't started yet. And the project's going ahead before your, your infrastructure uh, documentation is prepared and, and, and brought into, actually, by the, by the officers, and also before the new officer gets on board. So can we have at least the embryonic issues that are facing us now so that we don't start off with feet of clay you know, can we know what's going on now because you know this is you know we didn't know that ITT was going out we don't know who the who the adjudication team is we don't know the criteria who's going to appoint the lead uh, design team and what the likely uh, what the likely milestones are uh, up to design phase three so I mean as soon as we as soon as we get this data the better chair it's always difficult when you're trying to introduce new processes it's like a it's like a roundabout where you've you can't always stop it you've got to you know try to manage these things as you as you go along and uh, make uh, all the necessary improvements I must say in all my years of experience in running projects and what have you um, this is day-to-day -day stuff for project managers and officers and it isn't always reported in the detail that maybe Councillor Moore is looking at um, it's normally left for you know officers to get on with it the principal milestones and when things are going to happen are reported. And as I say, they will be reported. And I think Mike's picked up a number of things about the budget there. Perhaps if it had a, a timeline on there as well, maybe to introduce some of this uh, topic, then it may have explained what's coming up next. But uh, normally I would say that uh, a lot of this stuff is dealt with as a matter of day-to-day -day activity by project managers and not always reported in um, the detail that maybe Councillor Moll is looking for. Thank you very much. Well, uh, Councillor Morley, yes. Uh, sorry, Chair, and thank you. I'm not looking for that much detail. I mean, talk to this panel. We had a presentation. I can't remember. I need to go back into the uh, into the archive. I I would suspect that it was around about uh, the summertime. I remember the presentation, and I remember the balloons at the end of it, and it said, you know, uh, next steps, and then the balloons came out. Any questions? And the next steps. But the one step was we are going to appoint a lead design team of uh, phases one to three uh, with a break and then possibly carry on, depending upon what, what we think the design should be. Well, that's the last this, this, the last this panel has heard officially. And so a lot has gone on since then. Then all of a sudden we get the news to say the, uh, the balloon's gone up. So uh, I, I do think we need something rather than to wait for uh, Mr. E Mr. Ecott's uh, uh, schematics and, and project management control documentation uh, coming coming to the fore. I still sense the officers are reluctant to get on board. That might be harsh, but there we are. it's my view. Thank you. I have I have done respond. Okay. Yeah, just just following on from that, um, Councillor Morley, and following on from Russell's points about the, the changes that are being made to some of the processes. I think um, if, if if this is going to be useful. Uh, as a as a as a panel meeting around the guild hall i think we need to be really really clear we're, we're not shying away from presenting information and providing you with what you need to do your function on this panel i think we just need to be really really clear um you know i guess between now and the next meeting exactly what your expectations are and what we can help you with being really really specific about the information you need and then we can um, we, we can you know we can help you. I think the best way forward on this is for Councillor Morley to be a specific in a communication with the team for our next R and D meeting about what he would actually expect to see um, in terms of reporting. Because I, I have uh, some sympathy with Councillor Morley's view. However, we cannot spend every R and D meeting talking about the guild hall so it needs to be a pricey it needs to be a brief update and it needs to respond to members concerns so i wonder if this isn't a way forward indeed
that is the way forward that we're going to go. So if you put your specific concerns, Councillor Morley, in an email and our next R&D meeting, we will address those. But in pricey form, if I could ask you, otherwise we will not talk about anything else. Yes, Councillor Morley. Uh, just don't forget that there, as Councillor Knuckles is on the air, that there is a task group for the Guildhall and the CIO, and that no information has come through to that yet. And maybe we could go through that route as well. We, I mean, not necessarily dependent upon the next R&D meeting. And uh, no, no information gone to the members of that working group either. That was a, a task group or whichever, whatever we call it. You know, that was a, that was a bolted out of the blue as well, that the balloon had gone up. So there is something fundamentally wrong about information being presented by officers to, to members. And uh, I, I, I will take on board that, but I'm sure maybe Councillor Knuckles would like to vet it as well first, as she's the chair of, uh, of the working or the task group. Thank you. Councillor Middleton. Yeah. I think just in, in a slight response to, to Councillor Moy, I think we've got to fundamentally go back to the principles of what's the role of officers and what's the role of members. You know, the, the things that Councillor Morley describes, as he said, there was a paper that come through R&D, there was a decision that went to Cabinet. We made that strategic decision to, to crack on with this project. And as he stated himself, a part of the next steps of what we've all seen before through that democratic process is to appoint the design team. Now, I do think there becomes an element of this whereby we've made the decision to crack on with the project, We've seen what the next steps are, and then we seem surprised that the officers are getting on with what the next steps are, which is to go out and appoint the design team. That's something that I would wholeheartedly expect the officers get on with following that democratic decision. We have got the task group. I believe they're set to meet before the end of January, and there's obviously the reasons for why we set up that task group. Um, but I think we do just have to be cautious around that. I mean, Councillor Morley challenges the, you know, which is fundamentally the procurement process that is set out by the council. You know, we as councillors through the chief exec invest tens of thousands into hundreds of thousands of pounds in professional people that are there to do that job. And that is their job. And as Russell has said, a lot of the things we're challenging, they are, you know, that is their day job, you know, and that's part of the officer's role within a council and not necessarily the, the strategic side of, of the role of a councillor. And we have to trust our officers who are appointed into their positions to do the work that, that they're appointed to do. Councillor Moriarty. Thank you, Chair. Um, Councillor Middleton is normally very gracious when he makes a speech like that and says, far be it from me as a member of the cabinet to tell a panel what to do. Well, he didn't say that this time, but he should have done. Um, it is our job to examine officers' decisions and um, cabinet decisions. And this item came to CPP because there was some concern about the, 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 the amount that was on the procurement notice of 1.7 million as a percentage of um, a bill that was only around 5 million. So it's a legitimate question. And, and uh, I think, um, but I applaud the way you suggested dealing with it, that we don't want to spend all our time looking at this. I'm not sure if it fill, fills, fill falls within the remit of the the, uh, the 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 task group chaired by Councillor Knockholz, but one way or another, I'm sure we can we can get to the bottom of this. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going to, uh, Councillor Rives, I do see you, but I'm going to call Councillor Knockholz to um, uh, uh, add her penneth to this debate. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Chairman. I haven't got a lot to say. Just to say that I have met with Duncan and Mike, and we have put out the agenda today for the task group meeting next week and um, if possible a draft service, le service level agreement will also be sent out before the meeting. I do know um, because of Christmas breaks and illness the draft service level agreement has been delayed but we're hoping that some of that information will come to the task group and you'll see the other subjects on the, on the agenda ready for us to, to discuss. Uh, Councillor Ribes. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have a feeling I speak for a number of councillors and certainly a lot of people in the borough. When I looked at these numbers for uh, the first time in the last few days, I was absolutely shocked how they made up. 
this has become an enormous project uh, at the moment, a 12 million pound project. As I recall, around about two or three years ago, it suggested as being a four million pound project. I've had people coming to me sort of muttering things like gravy train and what on earth is going on. This is a huge amount of money which this council is sort of committing. And it seems to have grown incrementally. The moment you look aside, you suddenly find another couple of million being added on. I think what sort of shocks me is that the Guildhall element is around about 1.5 million, which is only just over 10% of the overall budget. And I don't think I can ask any question here which can be answered, but I would like to express my very genuine concern that this is going over budget. And this is a, a comment I've had put to me as recently as today, that you know, people are concerned that in these times, this council is spending this enormous amount of money on this project. And um, I have to say the economic benefits aren't clear to absolutely everyone. And within the context of the town fund, if we look at this project, and the, um, the community hub project, that has basically eaten up all of the 25 million pounds. We know that the National Lottery Fund, National Lottery Heritage Fund was not impressed by the business case and sort of withheld their money. And that's clearly going to put pressure upon whoever is sort of running this administration over the next two or three years to make up that shortfall. And I just think that we as councillors are perhaps letting the project run away a bit with this. And we really need to be asking, is it really a 12 million pound project? given that it was put forward as a three or four million pound project a couple of years ago. So as I say, I don't expect a question or an answer now like that, but I just do want councillors and officers to be very aware that not everyone in this borough is happy with the sums of money which are being involved in this project. And not everyone, and people who are, would normally be intuitively supportive, as I myself am, because I think the Guildhall project is a wonderful opportunity for Kingston. But it does make me shudder when I see these very large numbers of money coming up. And as I say, when people talk to me about gravy trains, I don't have an immediate answer to explain why they should be intuitively supporting this. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your comments, Councillor Ives. Always welcome. Um, do I have anybody else wishing to contribute to this? I think as a result of the discussion, I think we are going to ask Councillor Morley to put specific requests for our next meeting to be addressed. And if they can be put in email form in the way that Councillor Diwali put his concerns so that the request and the answer can be read out at our meeting and we can ensure that we are fully informed about every stage of this project. Um, I'm just asking members of this panel do you find that an acceptable way forward? Because I don't want to feel that we're, yes. yeah. Yeah, okay, thank you very, very much. Thank you, Mike. I don't know if you're still there. We've gone off for a cup of tea, but. Um, okay, we are no, we're noting the update. And I do thank everybody for their contributions to this. We, obviously this is a project very dear to everybody's heart. And we do need transparency on it perhaps a little more than we would normally expect on a project like this. Thank you. Um, we a verbal update on the painting of the railway gates, which is deferred to next meeting. Chair, sorry, I think we've missed an item. No, I have, I'm just about to come on. Okay, <laughs> Don't worry, Becky. Town deal projects update. Um, Duncan or Gemma, do you have anything apart from the Guildhall to update us on the project, because I can feel a wince from my left. Thank you. I'm happy to provide the update unless you want to uh, start, Duncan, at all. Are you happy for me to? No, no please proceed. Yep. OK, That's so great. we've, sorry. I think we're just mindful of time, aren't we? Yes, yeah. OK, all. so I will be, so I will be, brief. I will be quick. So. The information we've provided is the same format, actually, that we pr uh, produce um, programmes updates for Councillor Middleton and Councillor Blunt for their council reports. So uh, this might be a format that you're familiar with, but going forward, like Russell said, there's a review about how we provide project um, progress and updates to members through um, access to highlight reports and reporting through to the Member Major Projects Board. But for now, this is a uh, a high level overview of uh, specific progress on individual projects. Uh, just as a, uh, a short summary in terms of the programme overall, all of the business cases have been approved by government and the first annual payments for 2022-2023 have been made from uh, government. Future payments for projects will be based on annual monitoring and assurance performance. So this is why it's incredibly important that we 
continue to press on with the development and delivery of projects to make sure that we are meeting um, you know, the milestones that we set out in the business cases. Uh, we are currently, uh, because we've gone from a transition from business case to uh, next stage of development and delivery, we are reviewing our programme management, as Russell um, mentioned, arrangements and also getting funding agreements agreed with uh, lead, to lead delivery partners on certain projects uh, like Norfolk County Council. Um, we are also uh, going to be updating the Town Deal Board's terms of reference and local assurance framework to make sure that's fit for purpose for the delivery phase, and that will come forward through to Cabinet for approval in due course. Um, and um, that really is uh, a very high level summary in terms of the overall programme, and you should have in front of you, um, as I said, that summary of the project uh, updates generally. Happy to take any questions. Thank you, Gemma. Do, Duncan wishes to add something. Yeah, just to, just to add a point to that, and it kind of picks up some of what Councillor Morley uh, was talking about earlier, and that's that we're at a stage at the moment where we're we're looking to make sure that we've got um, the right resources, and that's not just about capacity; it's about expertise. And we are, you know, we remain realistic about the the expertise and the and the and the resource we've got in the council. So we're looking at the moment. Um, we've had. Uh, Russell's support, but we're we're looking at some specific um, additional resources for project management, and we're looking at, at, across at the projects, specifically um, the Riverfront and the Guildhall, about uh, what what sort of resources we need and making sure they're in place um, uh, before we go any further. Thank you. Do I have any comments from colleagues? No. Then it remains to me only to thank Gemma and Duncan for that. Sorry. Sorry, Councillor Rives has got something. Oh, Councillor Rives, sorry, I missed your hand. Councillor Rives. Thank you. Sorry, that I hadn't lowered my hand from last time. I've got no questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to ask Lorraine. Oh, Councillor Morley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Sorry, I didn't make my, didn't put my hand up sufficiently. It's merging with the well, it's my camouflage, and it doesn't go. It yeah, and it, it doesn't. Please, your question, please. Um, it's just a question of the key risks here and uh, the coordination across the uh, across the piece uh, that we have for uh, the governance statement, the risk registers. Uh, do do these risks are these risks compatible with? Their, with are they highlighted anywhere else? Rather than just in this uh, in this document, you know, is there consistency? That's what that's the question. And secondly, it's just as a it's just a bit of a niggle with me personally, really. Is why does this come under the Vision Kings Lynn banner and not under the Kings Lynn uh, uh, borough? Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna I'm gonna back this one to the other end of the room in a minute. But the in terms of the risk register question, yes, there are risk registers within, within project boards. As you'd expect, there are program-wide risk registers, and there's obviously the the corporate um, risk register, and it's something that Russell can elaborate on a bit um, in terms of some of the work he's been doing to support us. Um, oh, okay. It's just a simple question, Duncan. Really, it's just you know, if you look at the other registers, will they, will you get the same words? Will you get the same words as they are here? You know, are we? You know, have we? Have we got the consistency across the piece? You know, that's that's, that's it. that. Yeah, that's some that's something that we're looking at, and Russ, Russell can just pick up on that. Yeah. Lorraine, and yes, pick up your point. Vision Kings Lynn that does need to be removed and borough council. Gemma can perhaps pick that up in the next report. Thank you. Thank you. Um, although the next item is looks like it's an exempt item, what I'm actually going to do is take the next item and if it strays into exempt territory, we will then pause the meeting and move into closed session. So rather than do it in the order in which probably appears on your agendas, with everybody's permission, I will take the Parkway Development Update next. Are you comfortable with that? Good Right, who's doing, David, hello. Thank you, Chair. 
Um, I'll try and be brief, um, given that uh, there may be a number of questions and um, time is quite short. Um, so the recommendations are um, that the cabinet recommends to full council that it approves the amended capital budget estimate from 48.367 million to 54.462 million, as detailed in section nine of the report for a revised capital program. Uh, delegated authority is given to the executive director in consultation. David, I'm so sorry. I know you've got your microphone. Could you move it a bit closer sorry. and shout at us for aged? Is this better? Oh, yes, I think it is. Uh, delegated authority is given to the executive Dire director for development services uh, in consultation with the portfolio holder for development and regeneration monitoring officer um, to approve the final terms of the PPC 2000 contract with Level Partnerships Limited under the Major Housing Partnership Development Management Agreement uh, dated April 2015 to deliver the project. Uh, the third recommendation is the Council shall dispose of the properties as set out in Table 1 of the report with the affordable and private rent of tenures transferred to the Council's wholly owned subsidiaries, West Norfolk Housing Company Limited and West Norfolk Property Limited. And recommendation four is that the Executive Director, in consultation with Portfolio Holder for Environment and the Portfolio Holder for Development and Regeneration and the Monitoring Officer, determine the future management arrangements for the proposed wildlife site wildlife and environment side to the east of the development. And the reasons for the decision are to deliver on the council's corporate objectives, um, the details of uh, which um, and the delivery of which is further detailed in section eight of the report, and to deliver affordable and private rented housing for acquisition by the council's wholly owned companies to support the delivery of uh, council corporate objectives. Um, I think if I just briefly um, uh, work through the sections, on the report because there are quite a few and, and then pause and ask for further questions. Um, but the first section of the report um, gives a background of um, how the scheme came to be and how the funding has been um, obtained for it through the, the ACP and the business rates pool, um, confirming the scheme will deliver affordable housing and uh, PRS housing as well. And that a report was brought to cabinet on, the 20, on August 2021 um, to consider a, a reduced size scheme to uh, abandon the um, road bridge over the railway line um, uh, for the 379 unit scheme that previously had consent uh, due to cost, but also due to concerns on environmental grounds. Um, the, the update on progress um, gives the detail of the tenure split of the screen. This scheme is shown in table one. Um, and um, the works which have been completed to date in terms of the 106 has been completed, pre-commencement planning conditions have been discharged, uh, detailed design development has been progressed and the housing designs, utility companies are engaged. Um, the um, naming of the development um, has um, um, been as a consultation with the local high school, Kings Lynn Academy, um, who were engaged and um, the uh, children in the school asked us to name the scheme uh, Florence Fields. That's the name of the scheme for the marketing of the development, not the name of the scheme when it's finished. And uh, we've undertaken a full financial adjudication with levels and that high level appraisal um, is included in exempt appendix three, uh, which we can come on to later if, uh, if we need to. Design and other due diligence has progressed to the point where the development can commence on site and an investment on the PRS housing is included in appendix five, but um, there's uh, been an error noted in Appendix 5. We'll need to withdraw that and uh, bring that back to, to Cabinet um, um, with, as a separate paper. Um, it's only a small error. The, uh, the programme of the works says uh, setting out what the original date was and the revised date. There is not very much change in that, although the scope and size of the development has changed from 379 units down to 226. Um, so therefore, the uh, scheme will develop in a relatively short period of time compared to the original visage development. Um, the wider benefits to the development um, are detailed in that there uh, will be environmental enhancements, EV charging and large windows, maximise solar PV throughout, air source heat pumps throughout in lieu of gas central heating and higher thermal efficiency and insulation, which is uh, in excess of building regulations requirements, um, along with uh, a great amount of time which has been uh, spent on design and sense of place uh, with the local authority, the local planning authority. Um, the environmental enhancements have um, 
are estimated to be at least 1.7 million pounds more like 2 million pounds of uh, additional enhancements that a normal developer wouldn't need to provide, um, but the borough is proposing to do anyway. Um, section five uh, details the arrangements for the uh, designation and management for, of the wildlife site as part of the investment in the Parkway project. Um, table three um, uh, discusses the um, offsite 106, uh, six, one, section 106 contributions. Um, table four highlights the, um, um, uh, the anticipated council tax uh, revenues that the development will generate from 226 homes based on the average band D. Uh, there will be a range of properties within the scheme, but we've uh, been given the band D average to, to use for this report. The proposed wildlife and environment site, the development and management plan for this is a pre-commencement condition, uh, which we've been working to working through in partnership with our operations um, section and also with the Norfolk Wildlife Trust. And um, we will uh, complete the, um, the proposals for that in consultation with the portfolio holder uh, for environments as well as the portfolio holder for regeneration. Um, there's an item there on section six about acquisition of land from the third parties. The site boundaries as we purchased um, from the Academy don't quite line up with the land registry titles. It's a, a minor issue that we um, feel can be resolved and it won't uh, prevent the development from going forward. Um, but the worst case scenario, some of the gardens will be um, shorter um, than we would like them to be. Uh, within the scheme, there will need to be transfer of land to third parties, highways to the highways authority, um, parking areas and parking courts to the people in the properties that live immediately adjacent to them through management companies, these are all normal um, uh, things that we have to do. Um, both that and uh, dealing with the issue of the acquisition on the of third parties is within the delegated or the scheme of delegation that we have um, but that the executive director in consultation with the portfolio holder can deal with. Um, section eight goes through the um, policy implications, delivering growth in the economy with local housing, um, um, by delivering on the council's affordable housing policy through compliant delivery of 15% affordable housing, uh, despite the viability challenges that the scheme faces, protecting and, and enhancing the environment, including tackling change by implementing council's carbon reduction strategy, the environmental enhancements included within the design, the scheme will help deliver the council's commitment to be carbon neutral by 2035. Improving social mobility and inclusion through stimulation of economic activity in the local area. There will be direct and indirect employment in the creation of apprenticeships within the local construction industry. And once the scheme is developed, there uh, will be the, um, the ongoing um, stimulation in the economy from services which are required by those houses. For example, maintenance of air source heat pumps. Creating and maintaining good quality spaces that make a difference to people's lives through improving open and green spaces that are accessible for all that promote active lifestyles and clean travel options, both within the site and by connecting it to its surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, green travel corridors will then be able to connect through uh, this development, this development into the town. And this is also um, something which will reinforce and enhance the work that we're doing through the town's fund, the active and clean connectivity package where there is a lot of investment in the local cycling and walking infrastructure and active travel planning to encourage people to use active and clean travel choices as opposed to using cars and removing the barriers that will prevent them from doing that. This site will make a significant contribution to that. Um, the scheme will de uh, deliver 34 affordable homes uh, for the council's wholly owned affordable housing company, uh, which was approved by cabinet in 2016 and 46 private rented homes. Um, and the uh, which was approved by and the company was approved by cabinet in 2019. Um, 8.4 to 8.6 um, deal with the um, disposals under section 123 of the Local Government Act in 1972. I won't dwell on that in too much detail, but that's simply the authorities that the local authority has uh, to be able to deal with the disposals, particularly where the disposal of the affordable housing to the council's own housing company may be below an independent valuation of the value of that affordable housing. Um, section nine, um, details the financial viability assessment, and uh, which is shown in table six below. And in appendix seven, um, there is the valuation report, um, which feeds into that. 
And table seven summarizes the capital program estimate and the change in the current estimate to the January estimate and what the movement has been. And a, a more detailed development cash flow model calculating the development interest for the scheme is included in Appendix 6. Um, <clears throat> the uh, potential target savings opportunities of 771,000 that we believe we can make within the de development have not been taken. We're keeping those as contingencies at the moment. Um, we're pretty certain that we will be able to make those savings, but until we've been into the ground and actually realised that, that saving, we need to keep it in as a contingency sum. So we're very risk averse in our, in our financing budget here to ensure that we do have enough contingency. Um, and also we've not included for any additional revenues that we'll generate from the open market properties. Um, when these homes are sold, they're sold with minimal flooring and occupiers will normally need to specify carpeting in the lounge, in the bedrooms, et cetera. And that will be on average at least a thousand pounds per open market dwelling. Um, in the appraisal, the PRS homes are factored in a discount of 10% of open market value, um, and that is on the basis of it being a bulk sale, um, which is uh, considered to be uh, an appropriate level of discount for a disposal of that size to one single purchaser. Um, the actual value of the disposal of the PRS dwellings is uh, discussed in sections 9.18 and then in 9.19, um, the environmental enhancements are, um, are referred to again. The terms of personnel, this scheme is being delivered through the corporate project team using the major housing contract with Lovell. Um, the project offices costs will be capitalized, therefore taking off the, uh, the revenue budget, uh, which will reduce the pressure on uh, the net revenue expenditure. Uh, the environmental considerations is again just referring to the use of PV panels, air source heating, electric car charging, and other environmental technologies, which were previously outlined in sections four, five, and nine in the above. Um, the uh, statutory considerations are mentioned there, and uh, the EIA. And then there's a table on risk management implications um, shown in table eight, um, dealing with what happens if market values fall. Market value sales increases as expected, cost increases more than anticipated, higher than anticipated interest rates, and the borrowing requirement to the fund of the development phase. These are all addressed in, in Table 8. And then uh, Section 15 is the conclusion to the report. The uh, proposed development will deliver on the number of corporate objectives. Should the scheme not proceed, the Council will have expended 4.5 million on the site, and there could be a risk that. Um, ex the accelerated construction funding, um, Homes England might ask for that to be repaid. Um, the council is under a contract with Homes England to de deliver the housing at pace, which is determined, determined by the programme. So any delays in progressing with the scheme um, means that we fall into trouble with Homes England, who may determine that we're in breach and therefore take remedial action. And finally, should the council seek to dispose of the site to a third party for development, this may be an option. However, the recovery of the 4.5 million expended to date could be challenging. And there's uh, several background papers to the report and a number of appendices, uh, appendix three, um, five, six, and seven, of which are exempt. Thank you. Um, members. Councillor Moriarty. Thank you, Chair. Um, on page 237, we have a, uh, a table showing the tenure split. And my first question is probably of Duncan. Can he confirm to me and reassure me that that split matches what we say we need in our housing needs assessment? Uh, I think it was 2020. And my second question, and forgive me for not really understanding what's going on between us and our own housing company, but it seems to me, and correct me if I'm wrong, that we're giving an extra 1.2 million pounds off the price. Uh, what fills my um, email uh, at the moment is people not being able to move into um, housing association properties because they're not, being they're not being maintained and the work is being done to make them inhabitable. So we've got a lot of empty properties. We've got a, far too many people in bed and breakfast far too many people worrying about where, where they're going to be living and 1.2 million pounds would be quite useful in maybe going towards solving that. So I'd like to understand more about that discount and that the page 237 tenure split 
matches what our housing needs assessment tells us we need. Thank you. Thank you. David, do you want to respond? Um, yeah, well, I can respond for Duncan in terms of table one of the tennis fit. I think he will agree with me um, that that meets um, our local plan requirements in terms of uh, the local plan requirement for 15% of affordable housing and the uh, the tenure split between affordable rent and, and shared ownership. In in terms of the the, the discounts, um, the, the discount is is in, in effect on, on paper. The amount that we're transferring um, the affordable housing to West Norfolk Housing Company for is the amount that West Norfolk Housing Company can afford to pay for the affordable housing. The, the amount that any registered provider can afford to pay is determined generally by their cost of capital. Other registered providers more, who have more mature business models in the market have lower cost of capital um, than that um, which um, West Norfolk Housing Company has available to them, which has a direct impact on the price that West Norfolk Housing Company is available to pay. So that is why there is a, a discount there. Um, it could be possible for us to dispose of the housing to a third party registered provider, but that's not the recommendation in the report. And um, it's not the purpose of the housing companies as uh, was originally agreed by, by cabinet. Does that clarify your, your questions? Uh, I don't think it does, sorry. Um, my, my first question was about our housing needs assessment, not about the local plan. So, uh, unless I misheard you. And um, the second point, so we are giving the discount of 1.2 million pounds because that's all our company can afford and the recommendations we do that, and, but have we explored uh, other options and um, about this undervaluation of 1.2 million pounds, which could then possibly maybe not be used as I've described in my original question. Thank you. In terms of the housing needs assessment, I'll need to ask my colleague to, um, Duncan Hall to state what the housing needs assessment requires. However, the housing needs assessment does feed into the local plan and the local plan policy then determines the level of affordable housing, but Duncan. Well, we need lots more affordable housing than um, we uh, are delivering, um, but in terms of the, uh, is it compliant with the policy? That's the critical question and it's compliant with the policy. The policy, um, is, is determined not simply by the need, but by a, by a viability assessment. And we do that across the borough. So the policy is, is derived from those two elements, both the housing needs assessment and the, and the as I said, the viability study. Um, it, I'd, like, I'd just like to understand the question about the, the, um, the reduction or the discount. Do, do you mean the... 10% discount or the point that the affordable housing might be at a lower value or, or the, the price may, may be different from a price that could be achieved by disposing it to another housing association. I think it's the latter. Yeah, and I think I think there's um, I think I think that question is about you know going back to the to the fundamental objectives of having our own registered provider and, and the control that we have. And if you remember the context of that, we had we had housing associations that, that disinvested in their stock. And I think, yes, there, might, there may be, are we getting the best price? But I think the counter to that is, are we setting out to do what we wanted to achieve with that company, which is about having more control over, over the social housing in the area? Thank you. Are you waving a pencil? Uh, a little bit of clarification. I, I might be wrong. I'm, I'm trying to look at the figures. So if I'm right, am I assuming that this is obviously going to cost us like 54 in the region of 54 million for a 51 million pound return, which is like a 3 million pound shortfall? Um, obviously, would that be picked up? Would we be subsidising that? Are we subsidising private sector house, housing um, and are we always going to play victim for affordable housing if we're relying on the market forces and the viability of a business to supply much needed affordable housing? I take that on board I think you know 
members of the, this community, members of the public who are, who are listening to this, um, you know, could legitimately feel the buck stops here. I mean, we, 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 we've prepared a report for Cabinet. We're asking for a decision um, about uh, an enormous housing development in extremely turbulent times. But, I, I, you know, I'm just reflecting on some of the things that Councillor Moriarty said. I think we've got to, we've got to look at this in, in the whole. We've got to think about our responsibilities, our responsibilities under the national planning policy framework, around making sure that we plan for enough, um, and and that indeed uh, enough affordable housing and uh, private rented homes are delivered. We need to think about our responsibilities under the Homelessness Reduction Act, and that's about ensuring that we prevent homelessness of all sorts of all all households if they're eligible not in the way we did bef before uh, the act. So I think those things and the, and the contacts that you've had from, um, uh, you know, con constituents from, from local uh, households. I talked before Christmas at the um, Homelessness and Housing Supply Group that we're going in the wrong direction with homelessness. You know, some of the metrics around bed and breakfast spend, uh, just, just one example, we've spent £150,000 this year, we spent um, we've spent 16 on average in the last four or five. Um, we're seeing a change, you know, quarter in, quarter out, over three quarters. We've, we've seen a 30% increase in the number of people through the door asking for help. And that's something we've not seen for, for 15 years or so. So I think we, we need to uh, bear that in mind in terms of these decisions. The 15% affordable housing in, in terms of that percentage it's low, but we've tested this time and time again. Development in Kings Lynn can't support through, through the, the developer uh, more affordable housing than that. And yes, we do need more, but we need other ways in, in terms of delivering that. Um, but I, I would also say that private rented housing is so important in terms of meeting housing needs. And that's why, you know, the, the, the fact that we've seen an exodus of landlords, again, something I spoke about before Christmas, um, is, is a real concern. We're, we're not being able to use um, private rented sector in the way we've, we've done uh, in recent years. And if we're adding to the stock of that and we're in control of it through one of our own companies, uh, that, that, that's got to be better. And it's, 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 we've got to bear in mind, we've put these companies in place and we've got an opportunity to um, transfer a lot of these homes into those two companies uh, to help meet those wider objectives. Thank you. And does that answer your question? Kind of. So what, are we, is it a step back? Are we moving towards more, obviously the council's going to be operation, operating as a housing uh, association as such. Are we taking a step back, which I probably think would be a good move to actually have like council housing? Yeah, it goes beyond that scope of this item yeah. um but it, it's something that we'll bring back to councillors in terms of the ambition of, of both of our housing companies and some of the business planning work we're doing on that and yes i think having set those two companies up uh, and you know i won't repeat myself but given the housing market pressures that we we face and, the, and homelessness pressures i think it's a good time to think about our ambition and, and go further in the way you've described councillor uh, Lorraine, I'll just bring Lorraine in and I'll see you, Councillor Devon. Yeah. Yeah. And just to add to that, our, we set up a housing company, particularly West Norfolk Property Limited, to be to raise the standard. We, we've heard about the, the state of some of the properties, particularly in private rented. And we wanted as a council to set that exemplar standard about having those homes. And you'll see from this report the investment in some of those climate change measures as well that is not a requirement for us to do. But again, things that we want to lead by example so that others can follow. Slitter Wally. Thank you, Chair. Forgive me, I'm a bit tired, so I may have missed this, but I'm just not clear. Um, we've, we've, we've acknowledged that there um, is flood risk on this site and there are significant costs of mitigation. Um, I, it, it, it seems that we're also acknowledging that construction is entering challenging times. So I'm still not clear on the reasons for continuing with this site rather than seeking an alternative stroke alternatives. Thank you.
Anybody want to pick that one up? I, I can deal with the proceeding on this site. So, so the report sets out those wider benefits um, on the site. Um, we haven't got an alternative site. Um, Mr. David's going to correct me that's in the council's ownership. Um, you'll be aware of the other sites that we have developed. Um, yes, there are some um, challenges on development on the site, but there are some particular benefits. Duncan's just outlined some of the demands on housing, um, particularly in Kings Lynn and in the urban area um, that this site would address. Any, Councillor Morley. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, it just occurs to me, it occurred to me when you read this and, and, and on the local plan, is bearing in mind the current situation uh, as regards the, the homeless package, if you wish, whether or not uh, we should use the opportunity for this uh, development to increase the number of uh, affordable homes package uh, rather than, uh, which is the 15% or 25%, I can't remember now, 15%, and whether or not it would be beneficial for the, for the citizens of West Norfolk to have greater opportunities here through our own trading company. That's one. And two is if we do, uh, have we done any sensitivity analysis on if we do reduce uh, the, the number of, to, to meet the budget, if we do reduce the number of houses so that we don't incur so much expenditure, do we still get a return or do we actually need this number of, of, of houses for uh, sale to the private sector? So that's two. Three is, are we, does this sort of paper actually reauthorise the project or do we need a separate paper? This is a procedural matter that maybe the chief executive could talk about. It, it's a a 12 to 13 percent increase on the on the project costs and uh this paper just said well, we're going to plow on and we'll pay the extra well you know the, the, i think we should say is what are the options of not paying the extra uh and is this the proper authorization process and i suppose sensitivity uh testing does this etc so that's really the the, the package could, should we do more? Could we do more affordable housing? Have we done the sensitivity to say whether or not we, we need this amount of private development? Do we need to done the sensitivity uh, testing to see whether or not uh, we can reduce the numbers there to bring the project into but in within budget? I have no confidence in the figures anyway, personally. But there we go. Thanks. I can uh, respond on some of those uh, financial issues. Um, it would be fantastic to increase um, the number of affordable homes. Unfortunately, um, the contribution that a registered provider, even a council's own company, could make uh, towards the cost of affordable homes is less than the cost of development. So the more affordable homes we deliver, we'd need to fund them from, from somewhere else. I mean, for example, um, it may cost around £200,000 to develop a, a house that's then sold for £85,000 as affordable housing. And the way you get that back is from selling uh, a market housing house for the cost, say, 220000 to build for £300,000. So the less market housing you deliver, then the less affordable you can deliver. There are some substantial infrastructure costs on this site, um, which are best mitigated by maximising the number of dwellings on the site. And um, we have tried to ensure that we have maximised the number of dwellings and that we haven't missed, any, missed a trick anywhere. We have challenged uh, the local planning authority when we were hoping to get near 240, 250 homes, but in the interest of creating place and creating a better environment for everyone, um, the number that we can deliver on the site is 226. And um, in terms of um, sensitivity quest, uh, testing, could you... Just remind me, sorry, there were a number of points there. Well, it's just if you just... To bring it into budget, uh, you could reduce the number of houses. Obviously, there's an infrastructure cost still, but you're, you're reducing the housing cost of you know, construction. So if you done sensitivity, you say, well, we've got to save £6 million. So if we save £6 million on, on not building so many houses, you know, what's the sensitivity of that? Do we still come in with, will levels still be, you know, will they still make a profit? Will we, be, will we make a, a return on on uh, council tax uh, sufficiently, et cetera, et cetera. Or if we do halfway, and so we've only got three million pounds overspent, all we're saying is, well, we're so, the figures are so much 
uh, figure in the air still at the moment that we may be 12 or 15 or 20 million pounds over budget and so why bother with this now i mean i just don't you know i just i, I just fear for the whole project to be honest with you yeah you. the uh, the thing the figures are not very much in the air in terms of uh, market value and pricing um, we've um, had the valuation from the sales agents and also the independent valuations in terms of the building costs and um, we've been through a process of viability testing with a local planning authority and in terms of all the, the work packages, we've identified as far as we can do at this point uh, what the cost is of those individual packages. What we have found through the planning process and resubmitting for a fresh application on this site um, was um, a further requirement from Anglin Water uh, to mitigate flood risk elsewhere within the town, uh, which has added around about 600,000 to the site. The Environment Agency wanted the levels raised across the site. Uh, to mitigate flood issues, that's another 600 odd thousand. And you'd have to pay those no matter which number of dwellings you put in, as, long, as well as the number of highways improvements that the local highways authority wants around the area, which is another, around about another four or 500,000. There's quite a lot of big fixed costs that can only really be mitigated by increasing the number of units that you can deliver on the site, unfortunately. Uh, Councillor Rides. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, in a nutshell, then, are we in the situation whereby if we were to not proceed with this project, we would lose approximately £4.7 million, pounds, which has been invested in the project, and be required to pay back the accelerated funding we received from the government? So that might be a cost of this council around about £6 million pounds for the scheme. Uh, against that, we've got absolute uncertainty. I don't think Council Mall is numbers of 15 to 20 million pound deficit well one hopes they're, they're not realistic at all uh, but clearly we're going to be building at a time of great difficulty if we proceed with the project so on the assumptions which have been put forward to us it looks like one is projecting a deficit of perhaps around about three million i, I haven't got the papers in front of me because the way this ipad works but is that a fair summary of the of the two major choices I'm sorry, was there a question there? I didn't quite hear it. All right, so the, qu the question, would it be correct to say that, you know, the two major choices are to uh, proceed with the scheme, in which case we've got some assumptions which suggest that we'll have an overall deficit which will need to be funded by the taxpayer of £3 million, pounds, or if we sort of abort the scheme or put it on hold, we'll have an overall cost now of £6 million. Pounds. Is that a fair sort of statement of the choices facing the cabinet at this point in time, or have I, am I misstating the case? I think that's, that's one way of seeing it. What we're stating in the report is that the estimate is showing a deficit of 883,000. Um, but what we are showing is where we can make uh, significant cost savings and where we've made environmental enhancements in the scheme um, through our choice to meet other hmm. corporate objectives. Uh, in terms of if we walked away from the site, then yes, there are the costs which have been expended to date. And if we um, were um, required by Homes England to repay the funding, and um, yes, then that would be uh, um, money as well that the council would need to find. However, we would seek to engage, of course, with Homes England if um, we were unable to deliver the, the homes uh, that were supported <coughs> by the affordable uh, construction program on, on this site. But the net position we're presenting in this report is uh, we anticipate the estimate to be 883,000 pounds, not millions. Okay. Can I just address that 883 figure? I don't have the papers in front of me. When I looked at it, it seems to show that there'd be an overall increase in costs to from, I think it was 52 to 55, I, I can't remember. Uh, but it then showed an overall increase in revenues as well. And I found that sort of slightly surprising, given that the forecasts which you're using indicate an expected decline in house prices in this area of 11% in this year, and no recovery through until about three years and four in the future. So I couldn't quite understand how we're looking to see an increase in income. I mean, obviously, if there is that increase in income, and it's realistic to assume that the deficit is going to be of the order of £883,000, then that's one option as against an overall loss scenario of perhaps £6 million. But I, I was just, on the face, and I was just a little bit baffled as to how, how we seem to have a higher revenue figure uh, of eight, which give on the on the higher revenue figure um, the the previous cost estimate would be um, back in um, would be around about November of uh, 2021 um, and the January 2022 estimate is the current um, sales market estimate 
and there's been a lot of movement in house prices. Um, I think um, almost 20% in, in our area. So house prices are forecast to come down, but it's on the basis that they've gone up significantly as well. Over the longer term, um, if you look back over, you know, back as far as 1986, I think you will see that on average, capital value growth of housing is around about 6% per annum, but with some significant shifts in that. Um, there was clearly a period of negative equity in the late 80s, early 90s, and many people here will remember that uh, went on for a number of years. But over, in the longer term, um, what we see with the market is that the uh, the capital values to increase over time, predicting exactly um, what the sales values will be at this time um, is difficult. And certainly in 2023 is uh, when many um, analysts are suggesting we are going to see falls in prices <laughs> in the market, but it won't be consistent across the whole country. It will be heavily dependent on what the demand is in certain areas and what the price levels currently are and are very low in Kings Lynn. And the majority of the development sales on this site will occur from 2024 onwards, um, when house prices are forecast to be picking up again. But you were right to indicate there is certainly a risk of um, unknown changes in, in house prices, certainly when there are many commentators indicating there would be a fall. We've done the best that we can with the report to present uh, uh, what we believe to be the mitigated position going forward. Thank you. Thank you. Is there a, I was going um, to say, first of all, I think we're straying into the territory of speculation here, which is not um, really... I, I sort of disagree, because I think, you know, listeners to this will be under the impression that this council is looking at a £6 million loss potential, uh, and I think that will concern an awful lot of people, myself included, but if you want to bring the, the debate to an end, that's fine. Uh, Lorraine? Yes, just to complete on the questions from Councillor Morley, because I think he asked one about um, what were we actually asking to do and was it within the remit? Um, so, so this report is about um, final approval to proceed with the development. But as you can see from the report, um, it's to cabinet for them to recommend to full council because it is a key decision. So it would need to go through that process. Yeah. Okay. The Hudson, sorry. Hello. Uh, sorry, I had a bit of a problem with the microphone. Uh, yes, I've sat here listening to everything that everybody's had to say, and uh, I've taken note of all the uh, the figures that have come out. And uh, so what, what I'm looking at here is uh, uh, we're spending... 54 million for a return of 51 million. That means we've got a 3 million that's got to be made by the taxpayer. We've got all the added things that have been uh, put into what was originally anticipated, like the Anglia water drainage and things like that. I think what we need to remember is to go right back to the very, very beginning when we said that actually this land is no good for building on. And I think we've really got to look and say that the whole thing is a white elephant. Uh, nobody's mentioned how much, well, it has been slightly mentioned about the roads around Gaywood because we've not got through that yet. Nobody's come up with the answer to the fact that there is only one road into this estate. Now that was raised at an original planning committee and planning did say they would find another road to go into the estate. We've not heard anything about that. So at the end of the day, after listening to everything you've had to say, what with the increase in the cost of raw materials, the fact that housing prices are falling, we need to really look and see if this is a good time to spend all this money when at the end of the day, no matter how you do it, we are going, we, we the taxpayer, are going to have to find another three million pound to subsidize these houses. And that is not fair on we the taxpayer. And I think this is frankly 
some sort of, I don't know, some sort of vanity project by the club, by the council. You know, is this what the council are wanting? Oh, we can build anything and we can build it better. And frankly, these, this idea of how the heating the houses with ground heat in a flood area. I'm sorry, there's so much wrong here that I think you've, somebody has just lost the plan. We're wanting to build decent homes in a decent area for people that need them. And this is not the area. And we cannot afford at this time to be looking at a shortfall of three million when we know already that the council is going to have to find extra money to pay for the increased costs of gas and electricity, which is going to be well over a million pound a year, as I'm sure you already know. So can we just have a bit of common sense in here and think very carefully when somebody puts the idea of this to the, ca uh, to the cabinet, that maybe there is some brains somewhere and say, no, we are going to put this on hold until a more financially and economical time comes round. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. I have Councillor Crofts and Councillor Blunt, I see you. Madam Chairman, uh, I've just heard the last speaker. Can we let everybody know the vast bulk of Kings Lynn is in a flood zone? So if you don't want to build here, you won't build there, nor there, nor there, because it's a flood zone. Some are more extreme than others. This is not exactly extreme, but it is a flood zone, like most of Kings Lynn. The other thing, I chaired the meeting when this went through. It, it took all day. There was, I believe, perhaps the council was there. I don't know. But it was scrutinised extreme. All the morning was taken with, I allowed people to have speeches. And then when we go to the afternoon, I then insisted on having questions to officers. So it was, it was, it was scrutinised to the extreme. The, the, this, the business about the roads and the access arrangements, that was all discussed at length. But the point of it is the planning committee decided that it should proceed. So we've got to that stage, so it's gone ahead. There's always going to be headaches created when you do go ahead, but, but this is the situation we're in now. There'll be other hiccups that get in place, but you get over them. But the point is, it was an allocated site. It was done all above board. The scrutiny process no, was, was extreme. And, 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 uh, and, and I, I see no reason to go backwards rather than going forwards. Thank you, Councillor Crofts. Councillor Blunt. I haven't got much to say, just the fact that I think you need to consider what will be the benefit of delivering high quality, affordable homes and social homes to the people of West Norfolk. Thank you. I think that just about sums up. Thank you for your contribution, Councillor Hudson. No more comments. I would point out the panel are requested to consider the report and make any appropriate recommendations to cabinet. I have none, agree. There is a list of cabinet recommendations which have already been read out. Unless you wish me to read them out again, I will take them as read. Okay, thank you very much, panel. Thank you very much. That brings us to the end of our business today. And I thank you very much for what had been there. Yeah, sorry, we skipped over a few items, didn't we, earlier? So there are some. I'm sorry, you skipped over. Okay, I'm sorry. Come on, down. Right. We have, uh, as I said, thank you very much for your contribution to the debate today. It's been very interesting. It's been a full program, very important, I think. Uh, and now I'd like to draw your attention to the work program and forward decision list. As always, um, we are uh, always interested for any panel member who wishes something to be brought up in the future to make that contribution, to make that suggestion. So, um, I look forward to those. Um, and then I move to the date of the next meeting, which is Wednesday the 1st and Thursday the 2nd of February. Is that correct, Becky? It's dependent on what's on the board decision of this, which we'll agree yeah, on. Yeah, when you understand that we are working, uh, Councillor Gidney, Becky and I are working really hard to work out what actually is coming up for forward decisions to give 
this panel every chance to comment. So at the moment we've allocated those two dates, it may not be necessary, but I sort of ask for your um, patience on this matter because we've got quite a lot coming forward. So without further ado, I declare the meeting finished and pleasure to see everybody. If it's not too late, I wish everybody in the room a very happy new year. Thank you.